It sounds like a good time, though. I feel like I'd be game to make millions. Just how did I? Who did I? He did a ha. Welcome back to the Side by Side Guys Off Road Podcast. I'm Big Z. I am uh, Ian with the uh, full throttle batteries. Oh yeah, brother. <laughs> That's not Ian. That is Cooper. The Mini Cooper. The mi- the not so Mini Cooper. <laughs> yeah. uh, Maxi we have, Cooper. <laughs> we have a lot of. Uh, this is probably the biggest group of people ever on a podcast, I think. And uh, so let's go through real quick and just introduce everybody. Uh, Coop, you want to start? Sure. I'm uh, Cooper with Off Road Power Products. I'm Cam with uh, Momentum Media. I'm Ben Smith. You should say your trust. <laughs> <laughs> You're really unemployed. Thank you, COVID. Yeah. He is winning. <laughs> Brand speed is 17 seconds delayed. <laughs> <laughs> On my next. You're your next, bro. <laughs> yeah. Oh, my bad. I forgot the order. I'm Brad Get Page. with it, dog. Uh, I hail from California. Woo woo. <laughs> I'm Brian. I'm um, from Bam Bam Productions. <laughs> Who's that? <laughs> the guy on the video, Wes. Ow. Well, I don't have it like you do. He's like, I that's, a, guy. that's right. a handsome devil right there. That's Wes. <laughs> John Cena. <laughs> so I'm Wes from Two Frogs Racing. And I'm Ian with the bloody ear. Oh, man. Listening Nickelback. <laughs> Ian went full yeah, send on his headphones. I want you to think about what you were listening to there, son. <laughs> so uh, today we have a very special podcast. We have the entire crew minus Mike uh, from Two Fog Frogs Fog Two Fog, yeah, Two uh, Two Frogs Racing, uh, and uh, this is basically the entire crew that we we went out and conquered the Idaho BDR Trail. Mm-hmm. And if you're not familiar with that, uh, ride bdr.com slash Idaho BDR, I think, um, and we'll put that on the on the link list. Um, so we essentially conquered a eight day UTV. Tr- trail mess of a five day five day it was a five five day that got modified into an eight day it was a it was an epic adventure from nevada to canada and uh so we uh have a lot of stories to tell and uh top topography to talk about and and machines and things like that so um anybody have anything to say before we jump in yeah i kind of forgot most of it maybe we should go do it again as a quick refresher (laughs) you know just real quick it's like right outside you know (laughs) yeah i did half of it last week (laughs) yeah so ian you just got back from running the magruder trail again you took a handful of machines out and how how did that go uh, it went epic, went absolutely fantastic. And uh, I called Wes with some Wi-Fi from Elk City to, uh, I got. I, I kind of feel bad because I went through the Florence ghost town and that was the best trail on the entire trip. <laughs> Not even close, dude. It was so rad. So Wes, what, uh, tell us a little bit about, about that trail. Well, I'll tell you what, we had a blast. Uh, we drove all the way up from San Diego. And if you add the toad miles plus the 1500 basically that we ended up doing off road. Uh, I could have driven to Virginia beach and back to give you an idea of literally how much time we spent on the road over. We were at it about 11 days. What made you want to go with Virginia beach? I was stationed there. Ah. Uh, I just happened to have done that trip a bunch of times. And it, it seemed like I was on the road forever, just in Idaho, like getting home from Idaho from the Canadian border. (laughs) It just seems like I was in Idaho for a month. Yeah, you know, it, it took a long time, but it was a completely different kind of terrain than I'm used to driving. We we take for granted how beautiful it is in Southern California and the rot or the Sierras and uh, the Anza Borrego area. It really is a different kind of beautiful. But Jesus, those Sawtooth Mountains and uh, and the bitter roots, it, it was it was like driving through a coffee table book. Probably one of the coolest things that I've ever done, you know, over the course of a week. So let's let's give a little background here. Um, Wes, you kind of described two frogs racing because people you first of all, you've won the longest distance to the trip out of all of us, I think. Actually, um, Mike did. He came from IAB, which is literally at the Mexican border. The Mexican border. Mm-hmm. So Mike yeah, drove the way, entire way down there. height of he's about 25 miles south of me, but he could pitch and putt over the border from his house. Wow! So he gets the uh, he gets the entire North South Continental U.S. award. 
Wow. So give us a little background on you and Mike and what you're doing with Two Frogs and what you guys normally do and the terrain you normally ride. Well, we're from Southern California. Uh, both of us are actually originally from Northern California. And we met in the mid 90s in the SEAL teams. Uh, we both kind of had similar trucks and similar uh, activities outside of the of the military. And we became real fast friends and have been friends now for, you know, 25 years. Uh, our families are real close. And one of the things we started doing was adventure bike riding on BMW GS Adventures, doing long overnight over week trips with those. And then we got into racing and doing hard enduros on exactly the wrong bike. We were we were doing things like the Big Bear Trail Challenge on adventure bikes. And uh, if any of you are familiar, Brant and, uh, and Brian, you might be familiar with the Desert Dash down here. Mm-hmm. 100%. Yeah, we rode those on adventure bikes. And uh, we, I was doing about 70 down a power line road, hit a mystery whoop. Just, it was like a washout and got a real good look at, you know, tanks slapping. And I was, I was wrecking for long enough to realize that this wreck was going to cost me more than buying a KTM. And somehow I reeled it in and got into, uh, uh, I vowed to buy a KTM basically that minute bought a 525 EXC and then we started racing, uh, you know, the district 37 and district 38 motorcycle stuff, uh, just, you know, enduro racing. We weren't actually racing. People were actually trying to win. We were just trying to finish, but everybody around us had these cool, you know, race team stickers and, uh, and they looked like they were part of something and we're like, we need to get some stickers made. And, uh, Mike's like, well, I mean, what we're going to call ourselves. We're just two frogs racing. I'm like, not bad. Let's do that. <laughs> not bad. And so two uh. frogs racing was born. And, uh, it's been mostly a, uh, a lark until recently. We really didn't, there wasn't any, anything to be gained by it. And, uh, it was just something that we kind of did our adventures under to, to more identify instead of it being Mike and Wes, it was any two frogs. And so it's kind of become a little thing among seals that anybody who's going out racing, you know, is kind of part of two frogs racing, whether it's uh, like we raced in the mint this year with an all seal team. Uh, We've done quite a lot of different events where other two frogs are become those two frogs racing. Awesome. And you guys are, so basically you're, you're, you're used to riding down SoCal Baja type terrain and and those types of scenes, right? hundred percent. Yeah. It's, it's, I mean, we'll go up to Oakhurst and the Sierras and Mammoth and Kennedy Meadows and stuff like that. But really, it's really difficult to pass Johnson Valley if you're on your way anywhere. Gotcha. That place is God's country for off-roading. It's it's as fast, as big, as stupid, as rock crawly, as open washy, as desert flat, full speed lake bed. It's got everything except trees. Brian and, um, uh, uh, Brant kind of give us a uh, rundown. I'll start with Bam. Um, you know, kind of give us your background, what was going on while you were on the, on the ride with us. Yeah. I mean, so a little bit about me. Um, I've been freelance, uh, cinematographer going on about three, about three years now. Um, something that I just kind of fell in the scene. I used to race motocross back in the day. Um, always thought that was going to be my long-term career. Well, I mean, obviously things happen and, uh, that comes to an end real quick when you get life supported away and uh, <laughs> medical bills start stacking up. Um, so I got into the whole video scene and it's just something that I did for just a hobby. I was actually working in insurance at the time. Um, I mean, sitting at a desk, just dealing with fraud and then people trying to get free money. And I was like, you know what, I'm going to start pushing this, start seeing what I can do. Um, got into a lot of like motorsports. obviously motocross was my passion at the time. So I started doing just a lot of free projects, seeing, seeing if I could get exposure. Uh, the account, my Instagram just kind of grew bit by bit with all the free product that I used to give out. And then I started doing like a couple of the local, local series around there. Um, that lo- one of the local series actually got me tangled up with uh, Blake Wilkie and uh, kind of introduced me to the whole off-road scene, which I mean, from there pretty much just opened my doors. Um, me and him, he hit me up and he's like, Hey, we're taking a month's trip. We're going across the country. Can you pull it off? And it was like one of those things like, 
dude, I mean, my job's not going to give me a month off to, I mean, go travel and just have fun. Uh, so put in my two weeks and I was like, let's run with it. Let's see where this goes. And yeah, August, August, August was three years. Um, so yeah, I've been doing that ever since. And I mean, the motorsports is just where I'm at. And I mean, usually I'm more fast paced off road trucks. I mean, doing 110 by you hanging out of a helicopter type of thing, but the whole overlanding was definitely, definitely an eye opener. It was something that I always looked at and I was like, eh, like how could anyone like have fun in that type of field? Like it's so slow paced, like it's, where's the adrenaline in that? And then, I mean, getting to not only film it, but actually drive it and getting to like that accomplishment feeling at the end of it. It's just like, it really set in like after I got home and I was like, wow, like totally opened my eyes into something different. And uh, yeah, definitely something that I look forward to doing more of. Rad. And so you're, uh, you were working with a group of guys um, and your group uh, Revma that you're working with, uh, they came with us on the Washington BDR trail uh, and you were accompanied by uh, Brian uh, Kurd, right? And uh, he wasn't able to make this trip. And so we brought in the reinforcements. Yep, definitely. Um, Brian uh, Kurd, uh, obviously he's like the, he's like the main man behind Revma. Um, He has, he runs Revma media obviously he contracts me out under my company. And I mean, it's something that me and him just works super well. We've always hit it off since day one. Uh, we actually met randomly like out at King of the Hammers 2000, I think it was 2018. So it's been a while. Um, but he saw interest in what I was doing with Blake. He was all about Blake and trying to figure out what he can do like with him making TV content. And then, I mean, I was the right hand man at the time still am. Um, so, I mean, me and him just kind of travel all over. We did the Washington together. Um, it just so happened that he couldn't make the Idaho just because of, uh, some personal issues. So, I mean, my right-hand man, Brant, I mean, he's, if it's not Brian, it's Brant. So it's like one of those things like, Hey, I got to take someone along. And then he's like, well, I mean, pick a person like who, who are you taking? And he drew the short Brandt. straw. <laughs> so yeah, yeah. yeah straight up no but like brant's the right hand man i mean we've done multiple projects from it's funny because we actually met like randomly didn't know each other randomly down in mexico i got a ride down to mexico for baja 1000 and it was just like one of those trips that i wanted to go down so bad didn't know a ride there didn't know a ride back didn't know where i was staying and i was just like found a ride across the border got down there i met up with him and i was like hey where are you going like when are you leaving and it just so happened he was going right through San Diego. And I was like, dude, like, I know you don't know me, but can you drop me off in San Diego? Like, I need a ride back. And then, I mean, ever since then, it's just been project after project. So, yeah. Rad. So, uh, Brant, why don't you give us a little background on yourself and, uh, you know, how you got involved with this this goofball <laughs> and, and these guys? <laughs> yeah, yeah. So, um, I've been doing freelance for like three to four years now. Uh, I mean, I've been out of college like a year and a half this December will be two years. So I've kind of been pursuing it like full time now. Uh, I mean, while I was in college, I was doing it, but I was working like four different jobs at the same time. So just trying to balance everything. But um, yeah, like Ryan said, we went down to Mexico and then we just kicked it, you know, listened to reggae on the whole way home. And we just kind of vibed and <laughs> he had the same interest in, and work that the guy kind of had. So I was like, let's get on future projects and something like this was a dream for us to go and, um, you know, make a little money and go make content and just have a, a bitch and trip with some awesome guys so uh a few weeks prior actually like i knew about the trip i wasn't supposed to go i was supposed to be somewhere else uh like you said brian could not make it and um so we we're in tennessee a week before we left and then like two two or three days before we were, they were supposed to leave uh we made the call he's like are you going on the trip so i just kind of loaded up my clothes and then was supposed to meet uh, bam bam in las vegas and then i missed the flight of course <laughs> um you know and i was <laughs> i was super depressed because i knew it was gonna be a bitching trip so i was like well shit what do we do so i was you know just put my head down and, and got a few flights and flew to uh boise and then took an uber from boise out to whatever town that was and then waited for you glenn guys to up and glenn ferry's baby That's so we didn't know, i didn't know there. you were coming there and all of a sudden we got this Fucking hitchhiker. It's vagrant. <laughs> With luggage. A hobo. Hey, Mary, can I borrow a tie down? A hobo <laughs> introducing himself. Who's I'm like, oh, dude? hey. I mean, good for him. Oh, nice. Nice to meet you, Brent. <laughs> yeah, it's pretty much pretty much how I went. I, you know, hitchhiked my way down there. So that was that was cool. But uh just a little bit of background. Like uh I just come from like an off-road scene, outdoor scene. Um, my grandpa and daddy used to race in the desert, so 
it's just kind of my blood, like going fast. And that's sort of, you know, cars is just always had my interest. And, um, I love like 20 minutes, 20, I live like 25 minutes from Johnson Valley, 20 minutes from Barstow. So the desert's like a uh, super home to me. That's what I know. So going up into the trees was, was something totally different. Um, you know, one of the days we spent at the, the very, very bottom of the mountain, all in the trees, there was no sun and it was, it was freezing cold. It was not my, <laughs> was not my gig. Um, but you know, like I said, I, I have a huge passion for cars and rallies and stuff. So I know as me and Bam were scooting in the, the razor, it was so fun. It was just like a, like a dream. I felt like it was in a, a video game. So, um, that's kind of my background has come from shooting all kinds of cars, uh, feature films, uh, music videos, just kind of shot a little bit of everything. So this was a, a fun trip. I got to use all my experience in here. I even got to do a little bit of driving. Um, got to see the unbelievable. Bam, let like you of, drive uh, a little bit. <laughs> a little, he did. You know, he was he was scared holding on to those shit bar because then like right the passenger. Yeah, but you remember he, he is he was, belt blaster he was able to, Brent. He was able to brave <laughs> yeah. it, and you know we blew we blew a belt or two, but uh, overall it was a fun a fun uh, fun trip. And so you and Bam are can't wait to go back. You and Bam are a grinder success story then. <laughs> yeah, pretty much. Yeah, pretty much. Hey, straight, straight Mexico grinder. <laughs> <laughs> it's like I gotta find somebody on here to get a ride. Yeah, right? I swipe, swipe, swipe. Damn job, still a job. <laughs> Overland for eight days with a pair of Justin boots on through the Rocky Mountains. That was pretty epic. Yeah. Oh, don't act yeah. like you didn't get the bangers from Cam for giving him handies in the ride. <laughs> Somebody got the bills, great baby. Still him. Yeah. And and this podcast is gonna get a little e next to it. Yeah. <laughs> Our podcast just went from N- from freaking G to NC seventeen. Just so everyone knows, yeah. things got weird by the end of the trip. Yeah, hundred yeah. percent. So uh, in Idaho. So last on the uh, Zoom list here is uh, Ben Smith. You've been on the podcast a number of times. You joined us on the Washington BDR. Uh, and, uh, so you are Mr. YXZ. You are, uh, the, the one different from the rest of us for, for the most I'm part. I'm a little machine that almost could. That almost yeah, could. almost could. You are the weakest link. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, yeah, I mean, what was your kind of just initial impression on this just real quick? Uh, and I mean, we know mostly about you, so. The, the trip specifically, I was uh, something that Ian and I have been planning for a while and uh, super excited to have the opportunity to do it and bring along some some pretty epic people that that uh, pretty bunch of pretty stand up guys. Awesome. So uh, moving into the studio, uh, Cooper and Cameron, uh, why don't we start with uh, Cameron, since we've already knocked out two of the video guys, uh, kind of give us a little bit of background on yourself and what you're doing. Yeah. Um, so I'm Cam with Momentum Media. Um, and yeah, I've been doing um, media, video, photo um, for the last like six years now. Um, about five years ago, um, I kind of come from more of an action sports background, like skiing, mountain biking, um, and that sort of thing. Um, bumped into Brian, the owner of Off-Road and Diesel Power Products on the trail, and just started talking about shooting videos and been contracting with these guys for over five years now, um, shooting all their um, product overviews, trips, um, and that sort of thing. And yeah, kind of same story as Bam. Start, started shooting stuff, you know, for free to get your get your foot in the door and, you know, learn um, all the different tricks of the trade. And yeah, just trying to shoot fun, fun, epic stuff all the time. So Rad. And so you're saying you've been working with uh, Brian. with uh, the diesel power products and the off-road power products for five years. Yep. Uh, and that's where and that uh, you come from. <laughs> <laughs> um, and so uh, that's where you're coming from, Cooper. Uh, kind of give us your background there. Yeah, I um, I've been with uh, diesel and off-road power products for about ten years now, and had been into um, off-roading obviously for quite some time uh, growing up, and then uh, um, it just kind of jumped Coops into like uh, what's that, Wes? Your your mic needed to come way up. It needed to come way up. <laughs> That's <way> better. <laughs> stop! Stop whispering in our ears right now. Up. Yeah, so sexy. let me tell you guys. Well, we had the sultry story. voice of Cameron, and then it switched over to the quiet, tame <laughs> oh, yeah. personality of Cooper. So I'm I'm about ninety percent certain Cameron oh, came along to give me something <laughs> to do. He's like the toddler I never knew I didn't want until he got there. 
<laughs> and now I've just been spending the last five years trying to keep him alive. <laughs> Here's my trail, Dad. <laughs> And then so, what happened is he met Bam Bam and Brent and realized that Coop or the, that Cameron's actually pretty mature. You like, know, holy cow. <laughs> I dodged a bullet on this one. He's great. Full chat. Yeah, could, have been, could have been way worse. Dang, Brent. You, uh, every time we look at you, you got something new going on. What you got? Yeah. Oh, you got lights. You got to show, light. show us up with the, the disco lights now. I see you, baby. Yeah, More yeah, flex. <laughs> this whole episode is just going to be one person <laughs> after another flexing yeah. on the other. This is <laughs> the, the whole problem is we've spent enough time together that we're comfortable getting weird. So it's good. Yeah, I was like, Joe, you've been doing this three years. Yeah, I'm at six. No big deal. Yeah, 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 which in Cooper years is probably like twelve. Poor little guy. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, I so. do gotta say we got we got pretty lucky that all the videographers did get along. Totally. Um, that was yeah, that was know. definitely something pretty cool that makes. I think it helped the trip trip out you know it was an interesting group of characters but everyone kind of like played their role and it mixed very well so i was i was stoked on that because i was a little worried going in i was like this could be a shit show seven was, strangers seven well days. there's no one saying that it wasn't a shit show at yeah. times <laughs> yeah i wasn't worried at all like i was talking you guys up i'm like yeah you guys are gonna vibe like right off the bat little did i know within about 20 minutes you guys were filming freaking new <laughs> You guys were so pumped on each other. <laughs> yeah, we were worried if you'd get along, it turned out to be us versus them. Yeah. They get along to still out their own team. Yeah, watch out. Follow us on TikTok. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but for real though, the just the whole crew, like with everyone and especially the camera guys, um, it was. It was seriously sweet working with people that are passionate, you know, on the same wavelength as you. Um, as well as like for Bam Bam and Brant and the rest of the guys, you know, Coop, I, and everyone else that lives in the Northwest, just showing our backyard and how cool it is. And yeah, it was fun. So, so let's jump into it a little yeah, bit. I mean, I don't want to spend too much time uh, BSing, but the uh, the trip itself, the reason we we went on it was because it, it kind of pushed us all to the limit and, and opened our eyes to some new things. Um, anyone got something to say about, you know, just kind of going into this trip before even, uh, hitting the trail, kind of any perspectives there? Well, I, I kind of, I kind of think the whole idea of, um, one, what the BDR itself brings to the table as far as a uh, long trip that is in the dirt primarily and gets you to see some of the best scenery there is in each state that it's designated for is pretty awesome. And then two, Taking this platform onto something that is primarily adventure bike style uh, trips and trying to figure out all those little pitfalls of, okay, what kind of gear, how much gear, what's in between, all the little challenges that come along with any big off-road wheeling trip, only micro-sized teeny <laughs> tiny with the UTV yeah. where, where space is a major issue and... Uh, and to try and challenge yourselves to to maybe be a little bit less comfortable than you would be just because you don't want to carry the extra weight and and do all that. I I I loved it. I thought it was great. Every every minute of it trying to figure out how to set up the rig to seeing the terrain to getting drifty on the corners to meeting new people and and just getting goofy. There was a, a kind of a perspective I was going into this one coming off the Washington Trail of how can I minimize even further? How can I get you know, leaner and meaner on, on the trail. And, uh, I kind of found myself once we were, I don't know, three days in not really caring about any of it. Right. Like I just really didn't care about what I packed, what I had, what I didn't have. I just was just like, I'm out here and this is a, this is quite a different experience than I was exper experiencing on the Washington trail. Uh, and I think that was because it was more people, it was more diverse terrain. It was more, mm. uh, just more of everything. And it kind of overwhelmed me a bit to be you know, focus on just what I had loaded out. Like, did this work right? Or did this, what am I missing? Why am I so upset? I don't have this thing. I was more focused on the people, the experience, the driving, all that kind of stuff. Yeah. And cargo straps. Yeah. I really yeah. appreciated that Wes brought the massage table, you know, the panini <laughs> yeah. press, you know, the, you know, the dishwasher, you know, I've been doing this long enough that I don't fuck around. In the yeah. Field. No, we really appreciate it. So yeah, that worked out right. Yeah. <laughs> and yeah, it's it's like, yeah, yeah, you know. start you start doing it enough and then you realize what you do and don't reach for in the rig. 
Right. And all of a sudden, even the way you packed when you started it shifts around. So the stuff you use more often gets to be more accessible. And then you really start noticing <laughs> what's on wow, the bottom. <laughs> I really, I really packed yeah. a whole bunch of crap that I didn't need at all because I never touched it once. Like we weren't really at camp long enough to worry about sleeping. Let's right. be real. Right. <laughs> <laughs> so quick, quick and easy, down and dirty was about all we needed. <laughs> so Brant, coming from the um, the Washington Ian was crib. trying to talk. Oh, sorry, Ian, go ahead. No, I was going to say what you guys are touching on is kind of the difference between an overlander versus like an adventure rider. Adventure riders focus a little bit more on the ride itself and going from the start to the finish where overlanders have a tendency to really kind of embrace and enjoy the camping aspect of it. And you know, I don't know if I've set up camp during the daylight even three times. Yeah, you know, we should I, do this again and try that. Yeah, once we're up and three and weeks. And that's, you know, that's only by accident. Having rode with Wes, that's something I'm actually putting a lot more thought into just uh, some of the creature comforts of it. You know, I've, I'm reevaluating my loadout. And, you know, Zach made a comment about, uh, about lightening up his load, which is hilarious because before Washington, when I was telling him to lay everything out and then cut it in half, he's like, Oh no, 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 we were taking everything. And then he shows up in a Dr. Dre old low rider cut. <laughs> oh, I'm 90% certain he had a 8,000 pound razor on this trip. <laughs> Exactly. No, on the Washington, it was twice that. Like, no way. <laughs> I was negative squatting the whole time. <laughs> Would you have 40 pounds of beef jerky with you? <laughs> <laughs> Not until, uh, well, then Bam and Brian hit it, and then they just uh, kind of destroyed it. So, uh, which which seems to be a theme around uh, my jerky bag. So, um, But, uh, Brian, going into uh, this trip off of the Washington trip, kind of what was your change of of loadout? I mean, going in the Washington trip, you already had way too much stuff because you guys were going to another shoot right after that. So you had kind of like twice the luggage you would normally pack. But uh, going into this trip, what was your change of perspective uh, going from Washington into Idaho? Yeah, I mean, like, um, honestly, I'm really lucky that we got to do the Washington stuff. I know it was kind of a last minute thing on my end and with like having another shoot back to back with it. I mean, our loadout was completely ridiculous. And I mean, we kind of knew that going into it, um, but still getting to experience like a couple days of that type of, that type of trip, that type of adventure and kind of, I mean, like Coop said, like what, as the days go on, what kind of goes more towards the bottom. And then as other things come to the top and it's like, Hey, I need this constantly, like make it easy to grab. Don't have it down at the bottom of the seat. Um, Luckily enough for that trip, we had a four seater razor, which made it kind of nice. Um, I mean, we definitely had those back seats completely filled and, and stuff the on the roof. Yeah. Um, I actually took some of the luggage off of the roof, uh, hitting a sliding under a tree once or twice. Um, but we needed to, don't need to talk about that one. Um, <laughs> but yeah, go, going into the Idaho sun, uh, stuff, like trip, it was, um, I guess, I guess no me, preparation. I mean, I guess for me seeing the, seeing the email thread going around, I mean, it was definitely what I saw, saw going around. It was definitely overwhelming at first. I mean, there was things being talked about bringing chainsaws to, I mean, bringing stuff like literally household stuff. And it's like, well, shoot, like I have no clue what we're getting into. Like I thought Washington was already pretty gnarly myself, just kind of the whole overlanding since I'm not used to that type of adventure. Um, I know my loadout changed quite a bit just because of stuff. I mean, Hey, like, let's try to do more of a run and gun. I mean, I'm used to, I'm used to run and gun, but I always want to do more of that production where it's like more of a setup and go and like actually plan shoots with this type of stuff, trying to cover that much terrain in that little time. I mean, basically you're gumballing the whole run and it's something that you need access to pull a camera out grab a clip and jump back in seat belt up and get get going um i know like i bought new luggage for this whole trip just so it was more convenient on that um i think the one thing that we still struggle with is food um, especially when Wes and Mike pulled out the steaks <laughs> and we were sitting there like <laughs> eating salad off of like a beer box, like cardboard <laughs> box. <Flex. laughs> no fork, no nothing. We're just like, dude, we got this. We'll make it through it. And it was like, it was something that opens your eyes because you really don't think about that. I mean, at your house, the luxury is like open a fridge, you got this cool, throw it on the grill. And it's like, well, okay, we have a fire. 
but did we bring the utensils? Did we even bring the food? How do we boil this water? And it's like, oh, uh, shit. <laughs> um, but it's, uh, yeah. Man, man, let's call it what it is. That email thread scared Papa B off. A hundred percent, a hundred percent. And I mean, I it kind of scared me to scare him off even more because I was like, oh, he like took a hit on Washington. And I was like, I don't know, like this might be rough. And I mean, I had to bring the young dog, like, hey, this will yeah. can handle the woods for a week. Like, <laughs> Hey, go honey tortillas. Tortillas. just saying. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, the young dog runs yes. runs on bangers. We're good. <laughs> yeah, exactly. The, uh, you know what was really easy to grab was Brant's tent laying in the middle of the road. <laughs> True. I'm pretty sure that was out a couple times. <laughs> So, uh, you know, uh, Brant, going into this, you were kind of last second. You knew about the trip, but you didn't really know full scope of the trip, right? Like you really weren't Definitely. dived into everything. So what was your perspective going into this? Um, so like I said, we were, we were in Tennessee. They had talked about it and I knew about it. And the only reason I kind of paid attention is because I was editing. They were talking about it. And him, you know, an old man was like, I don't know if I could eat peanuts for six, seven days. Like, <laughs> you know, cholesterol on this. And so he was freaking out. He's going to do it. And, you know, bam, and I'm going back. So. I started kind of paying attention, but then once it was like, you're going, I was like, oh, shoot, I don't have a tent. I don't have this. I don't have this. I have to fly with all this stuff up to, um, you know, Idaho. I was like, how am I going to do that? So I kind of got with Bam, and I was like, all right, we'll kind of hit the Walmart up there, and we'll take some money. Hopefully, we get, a, you know, pots, pants, kind of this last-minute stuff. Then I missed my flight um, and had no food or nothing. So as I was on an airplane, you know, I get the little snacks. I was just saving them. Cause I knew they would come to clutch. <laughs> <laughs> so I was like, all right, I could ration off this. And then, um, definitely missing, not going to the store, not having food. And then just relying on gas station stuff was kind of tough. Cause it's just chips and just a bunch of crap. Um, so yeah, definitely not having like a heads up. And I, they're kind of telling me about the email threads about how serious it was. So I was like, well, this sounds pretty, pretty gnarly going into it. So, uh, definitely if I went again, I would definitely hit up these guys. I, I plan to get a jet boil. <laughs> That's going to save my life and some prepackaged meals like you guys are eating. Um, cause us not having utensils, pots, pans, no tortillas, no peanut butter, <laughs> honey. Um, you did eventually those sort of things. <laughs> yeah. We did, you know, that so. drive back once Coop left was like gold. <laughs> yeah. It was like we struck a struck It gold. just I keeps did. going. <laughs> yeah. yeah I we were pulling out bags have... after bags after <laughs> bags. <laughs> I wish that had come up because I would have loved to have uh, paid it forward and get you guys into it. Yeah, yeah and, it's all so, good. It's it it's something that I think, like for me personally, I'm the type that kind of learns from my mistakes in a way. So it was like to get through that and figure out, like, wow, like living off of who knew little salad. Who knew and, food like, was important? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah. So it's like it made it's it not made to rely on the hot dog stand. The next, uh, yeah. One thing that Mike and I talked about. <laughs> I'm still not happy with that one. <laughs> one thing that Mike and I talked about when it was all over was. We're like, well, they weren't super well prepared, but they were hard as coffin nails. You guys, uh, you know, you, you, a lot of people, when they didn't make up the time during the day that they want to make up, like, okay, we're going to do this many miles today. And instead of actually, um, instead of ending up doing the miles, they call it early and say, okay, we just did less today. You guys for what it's worth, you were hard and you'd, you'd drive through the night, you'd get to your goals, you'd suck it up. If you didn't bring enough food, it wasn't like, oh, I can't go any further. We don't have any food. Like, well, technically you can eat a tire, I guess. I mean, you guys <laughs> put out. That, was... that, that meant a lot to us. You know, it's like, well, they're stupid, but they're hard. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you got to be tough if you're going to be stupid. <laughs> it, yeah. It was definitely I feel like part. there's a compliment in there. So thanks, Wes. <laughs> yeah, so, somewhere. I, I got a fish for it. but <laughs> yeah. No, for real. It's being hard is a big part. You know, not being a pussy about it is a big deal. And you guys, uh, you guys definitely showed a lot of grit. Um, I, I think, think you were I, missing out hugely by driving at night. You know, you can see only what the headlights can see. And oh, meanwhile, I'm like anyone this. Anyone will disagree with you there. Yeah. That, there, that, yeah, it was a hard mix. It was it was cool driving at night. It just added like another. I mean, I like driving at night. I think it's cool. And it just kind of driving through the forest and coming around the turn and then seeing a log just halfway in the road. And you're like, am I going to kill my passenger? Am I not going to kill my passenger? <laughs> <laughs> God, kinda cool or, there was a cliff there. Or a cliff. So, Shish kebab. You know, I, I mean, love driving hard. at night, but I love driving at night. Because I want to, like you get camp set up yep. and then you go, 
go yeah, plays at night, do, do a night ride. It'd be fun. Get your footage or get your rocks off, you know, riding at night, but then come back yeah. to the camp and then pack up and then drive through the day to see the kind of, I mean, we were driving to Clark Fork to try to catch you guys. And there were just, there were vistas that we come up that, you know, it's just a 90 degree turn at night. You know, your lights see a 90 degree turn, mm-hmm. you turn left. And we would show up and you're like, oh my God, it's a postcard. Yeah. You know, they did not see this postcard. They did not yeah. get this view driving, you know, nine o'clock at night. So there's definitely lots to talk about when we're talking about scenery and what we saw and all that. So I would like to kind of work our way from south to north and kind of just over overview that whole process with everybody and not be uh, too in depth with it, but uh, just kind of give our listeners a, a kind of a perspective of what we experienced along the way. So um, you know we started down in Mountain Home, uh, our the the our side of the group mm-hmm. started in Mountain Home, uh, driving down from Spokane, Washington, um, and uh, we actually rented a, a Penske truck uh ian you picked up a a penske truck and uh we we threw the cars in that because we had to station the trucks and trailers up north um i believe uh ben's wife your your wife brought them up uh up north for us right and uh but we had to unlike washington where it was a loop trail Mm -hmm. uh the idaho trail was for basically everybody uh was a, a drop and pick up trail and uh so we had to do some logistics there and and ian did a great job taking care of that for us um and then uh yeah what what kind of happened down south and we started uh we we dropped off at razorback off-road they're a great uh supporter of the channel uh let us use their um their flatbed trucks to offload out of the penske and uh and then from there where'd we go oh we just made it up as we went along um we went from mountain home all the way south, which I got to tell you, that's 115 miles somewhere in there. Felt like more. I was, I was sitting in garbage thinking to myself, like, we just accomplished something. I'm like, yeah, we accomplished something. We got to the starting point. Yeah. It was, yeah. It was, kind, of a, it was kind of a chain of events that happened. You know, we we uh, we parked on the Snake, ri- Snake River and uh, got met up with Coop, and then we went down south and... Uh, you know, Bam Bam or Brand or Clyde or whoever the hell was driving wound up blowing a belt. And then uh, we had some particulates in the belt housing that was giving us some trouble. So we wound up camping on the side of the road. Mm. Coincidentally, the best night of sleep I had on the entire trip. But uh, <laughs> we wound up uh, meeting up with Wes down in Jarbage. And, you know, as far as that first leg of the trip goes from Jarbage to Glens Ferry, I'm good. Now that I've seen it, I'm good. If I ever do the BDR, it starts on Interstate 84 and goes north from there. <laughs> but, I'd say it starts in Pine. Yeah, yeah, pretty much. But uh, yeah, the, the first day is definitely definitely a dust bowl. It's a, uh, you know, it's just flat desert. Just flat a, boring. It, did anybody get an elevation reading reading through there? I want to say Except we were about the, the moose, huh, there, there Bam Bam? <laughs> yeah, I was like gonna moves. say I, I was gonna say the trip kind of started off, but I mean, right right off the get go, it started <laughs> off with a blown belt, ridiculous. camping at like yeah, <laughs> I mean, camp, camping in the middle of nowhere the first night at two o'clock, trying to deal with the belt issue, and then I was like, all right, cool, rough start, no big deal, and then the next day you're getting into town, and all of a sudden a moose jumps out and like almost goes through the side of your car, <laughs> like yeah, John Cena's really dog started. comes to visit, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> really set the trip. <laughs> Yeah. Yeah. There was a lot learned that night, just getting there, like parking brakes on X3s. <laughs> Who knew? <laughs> Who knew? They're important yeah. if you if you set up a hammock. If you have no X. trees and you're using an X3, right? <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. So we had that belt issue that caused us to kind of call it at like 1.30 in the morning, something like that, out in the middle of a sagebrush field. Holy stars, though. <laughs> but you could see everything. Yeah, it was right. amazing. Mm-hmm. Uh, I noticed the, the there was a power line system right down the road from where we were camping. It, it was making all sorts of weird noise all night yeah, long. All night. And uh, But uh, yeah, so we woke up early, uh, hit the trail, and uh, went into a big cut in the ground, canyon through the, to the ground. and the ravine. And ended up in uh, Yarbridge and uh, cool little town. Uh, some sweet people there. Some interesting. Uh, what was that guy's name at the at the restaurant? He was a unique guy. Hey, John. <laughs> he's uh, he's somebody that you should go uh, meet if you get the chance to. Yeah. Um, but uh, cool town. Like the gas stations ran out of someone's home. Like it's a it's a very small community, and they're in the middle of the desert in a ravine next to a creek. Like it's just out of nowhere. So pretty pretty interesting. But yeah, like Ian said. Uh, 
one time, and I don't think there was any need to go any further. <laughs> no, I mean, the guy gave us the rundown how the town got its name, and it's actually a, 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 an interpretation of a, one of the local natives' word for evil spirit. So, yeah, we don't need to go back there. <laughs> yeah, mm-hmm. we got our fill there, but very cool. And if you're, and if you're into uh, the full experience, definitely worth it, just if you're doing it twice. Yeah. You can skip it. Watch out for the cows. And at some points, those weren't uh, mud pies on the no. trail. And holy cow, the ears <laughs> on those rabbits. I, I think they were a little shorter <laughs> after our trip, actually. Yeah. <laughs> hey, Ian, Glenn's Ferry is at 2,500 feet. Yeah, I want to say Jarbage is up over five. But, uh, yeah, I think I just heard Zach call it Yarbridge. Yeah. Did, I, did yeah. I put the R in there? Oh, my bad. I've heard about six different pronunciations of garbage. <laughs> there, there's no bridge. It, it's not garbage. Yeah. It's garbage. Garbage. But uh, so yeah, we got out of there uh, the next day. We did some filming with the with the guys. Did some interviewing. Um, you can see some pretty cool uh, teasers uh, from Cam on that. And um, and Bam and those guys are putting stuff out. Um, and then uh, we made our way north. And like like you guys said, uh, pretty much just all flat desert farmlands and and roads and there was a quite a bit of pavement on that stretch as well um yeah was that was that the stretch that we made it to trinity lakes no no that was back that was third night right i think the thing that was hilarious no, trinity lakes was first night garbage to trinity yeah yeah i think the thing that was hilarious it's like you're you're cruising along on this long straight stretch you're like sweet there's a turn like we got to be getting close, and then you make the left, and it's like another three million miles in a straight line. <laughs> yeah, with nothing. It's like straight out of a cartoon. Oh, totally. The, the worst thing about that no. was you'd get on a road with some wind on it, and you're like, "This is awesome! I can see the cars up ahead. I can like stay out of the dust." And then you make that turn, like you said, and then right you, into and, then, it. and then you're right into it, and you realize that you're in it for the next hour. Yeah. Oh, <laughs> yeah. The dust was like next level. I don't know that anyone could have fully prepared for that. It was like talcum powder. Yeah, it was moon dust. Yeah, yeah go to Baja. Oh yeah, go to the pretty beach. sure I still, pretty sure I still have some in my lungs. That sure. I'm sure of in Baja, <laughs> but we were in Idaho. <laughs> <laughs> Great yeah, White I'm, North. I'm sure that it was shocking. For up there because you guys get so much water yeah but i mean like the mint when you're racing in that uh you know that prim valley like the worst that it got coming into yellow pine remember driving through those uh through those trees where the dust just wouldn't go anywhere yeah imagine that for 20 miles each direction oh yeah where you can't get out of the dust it's the entire valley is like that yeah and so uh, we made it down these these farm roads and whatnot up to Glens Ferry. And then once you got north of Glens Ferry, we got into actually some terrain where the, it started breaking up a little bit and getting a little hilly. Mm-hmm. Uh, still a lot of pavement up to that point. But then once we hit the mountains, we could we got into some dirt. And uh, kind of what was your guys' perspective on uh, you know that that transition? Uh, I, I like it because the the, uh, the corners were perilous for the drops down to the. Um, <laughs> to your sudden death if you were to go over them and uh just how slidey they were they were so much fun there was lots of gravel and it was uh Whee! and uh, you went from being completely flat everywhere to being kind of droppy uh cliffy stuff and then we went up to and we hit a was that where we hit the um the first dam was that up there uh yeah the reservoir was sick. yeah the reservoir so that was pretty cool um haven't ever driven across a dam on a utv before no it wasn't very big it or anything. Was damn but fun. That was the Anderson Reservoir going into Pine. <laughs> right. So that was just south of Pine, uh, and we followed that reservoir pretty much. I would say a good half of the length miles. of it, something like that. Yeah. Yeah. Actually, the full length of it, we cut through the mountain on the one side, but mm. uh, that was a beautiful place. It was interesting seeing all the the water, you know, erosion on the sides of the cliffs and everything because it's it's pretty stark looking. Yeah. Um. Not a lot of it. Ve- still not a lot of vegetation to this point. We really haven't seen anything green besides sagebrush. Uh, all the way up to that point. Super slidey corners. Super slidey. <laughs> <laughs> so we garbage with 6,200, Ian. 6,200 at garbage? Yeah. At, at garbage. garbage. Not French Canadian. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah, you Sorry. betcha. Sorry. So, uh, you know, we went, made our way up to, to Pine uh, that first night, right? Or did we make it all the way to Petrini on that night? 
Trinity, I thought it was we wanted Trinity. to make it to fine because they had a bar that was going to be open till two in the morning, which I was happy to kick it at. And you guys wanted to go somewhere else, just ruining my fun. But was that our know, first pizza night? Yeah, yeah, yeah. That was that was pizza night. Thanks, oh. Coop. Yeah. Thanks, Coop. Shout out to Coop. Yeah. Shout out. <laughs> yeah. I've never been so thankful for a frozen pizza cooked on an oven in hey, my life. It's not delivery, boys. It's DiGiorno. <laughs> yeah. uh, we, we only smoke like six of them. <laughs> yeah. Another one. There was yeah. a... <laughs> Bring hey, me more! Six, Dude, six frozen fun. pizzas. Not a bad way to spend four and a half hours. <laughs> <laughs> the boys were high. <laughs> There was some talent at that bar. I think combined total between those three chicks had about 10 teeth. So I'll say. Oh, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> That's me, and they're going to listen to this. Uh, yep. And those were dudes. Dude. <laughs> <laughs> Got going, him. But uh, no, that, that place was awesome. That, uh, that, the guy that owned the resort rolled out the red carpet for us. He was hitting me up. Uh, he was telling me he wants us to bring a group. Hashtag grinder. Yeah, he uh, wants Flex. us to group in there. He says he's going to give a group discount there at the resort, bring in a band, and uh, it's going to be a party. So I'm going back. Yeah, there was a ton of UTVs up there, too. There it. were a lot of UTVs. Yeah, that, 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 it's hard now thinking back to think of that as all one country. day. That was crazy. That was a long day. That was a long day. Yeah. And that was a half day. We didn't get rolling until 1230. Right. It was pretty rad. That's but uh, the uh, the assault on the actual lake... Oh, I think that uh, Bam Bam, Brent, and I, we were winning that one. That was a lot of fun. Yeah. It was so epic. <laughs> Definitely. That for sure Sounds set like the Mike pace of like the driving. The <laughs> yeah. That was the only time my X3 right went on, into speed mode on the whole trip. <laughs> right on the edge of we're going to die. <laughs> yeah. So That was definitely fun. So how was everybody's sleep the first night? Oh, it was great. I slept in a hammock next to you. At, uh, <laughs> I only woke up like... 13 times thinking who is out here with a two stroke chainsaw cutting stuff down at this hour. <laughs> I was positive they were bears. I, I don't think the, uh, the question is how was the sleep that night? What people want to know, Zach is how was your alarm clock the next morning? <laughs> yeah. Is that what they want to know? Or do they want to know about Mike's bath? Oh, <laughs> <laughs> oh you thought we were getting away from that one. Huh? Kim? Yeah. Yeah, that, and about that boys. lake. That lake felt pretty dang good. I I was lucky enough to be the first one over to uh, jump in and try it out. And and let's just say that uh, Mike has zero inhibitions. Like there is no fear from that guy. <laughs> he went with full SEAL Team. He six. just went full birthday suit. And and what I think was the best thing about it is Cameron's out in the water in his skivvies, like back to him, like. <laughs> like washing up and stuff and and mike walks on out and cameron turns around and mike's like good two morning feet away. hey do you want to borrow my soap <laughs> <laughs> so so the, like and on that note i'm out <laughs> and, and did you not see a friend on the way back there either uh, on my. <laughs> <laughs> oh gosh. Uh, are we talking about the bear? Or are we talking about Mike here? Yeah. Well, uh, I was, well that could go there, both ways. Did you guys hear that whistle? By the way, later on in the night, there was a whistle. Oh, I was, I was, gosh. I was looking for clarification here because I heard uh, two stories. I thought uh, it might have been one. Oh gosh. Um. Yeah. Ian and I pulling into camp saw a bear. Um. After showering. I saw a bear. Too. <laughs> <laughs> so what you're saying is there's a family of bears. <laughs> there was a mama bear and a baby bear. Yes, yeah, just basically bears are all over the Idaho BDR. <laughs> <laughs> so so to talk about just getting to Trinity Lakes, there was a point where we decided that okay, this is the goal. We're gonna try to get to the lake and camp. And then somehow there was like our our one big group at night turned into like three groups at night. Oh, yeah. No, that was awesome, too, because we got to see some really cool terrain. <laughs> I don't know how we split up there. I don't know how it happened. Um, I was behind you, and then all of a sudden, I wasn't. And then you were in front of me. <laughs> and then I was like five miles away going, wait, what? <laughs> well, we were following the trail up to the lookout. Yeah. Well, it was funny because at one point, we're just seeing dust the whole time, and then... 
it clears up and you're seeing cars on the side of the mountain. Yeah. <laughs> like, wow. And you're like, how'd they get wow, there? They're way up there. But no. uh, I think they made a bad call because I think Cam and I were up there about 20 to 25 minutes before we saw anybody else. I had to go back to the trailhead to find you guys. And technically, you know, Mike, Mike is nowhere near hairy enough to be called a bear. That's actually called an otter. <laughs> <laughs> no, I was thinking they, they never mind. This is gonna go down. I'm just out. I'm out. Uh, Mike's, Mike's gonna get to sponsored by the end of this. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so at some point we got split up and I think uh Ben had taken a, a turn and I followed him because I ended up being behind him and I thought I was behind Coop. And then like like all the stuff got all mixed up and we, we ended up with the comms getting reconnected yeah. uh, and, and the buggy whips that were sending out the beacons. Here, here's Mike space. washing. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah. What's up, guys? <laughs> well, Mike well, showed up at the lake to go take a bath right when I was getting out. I'm like, oh, we're snake out already. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> and that then started the whole rest Flex. of the trips uh, yeah. <laughs> nomenclature. It's good so. to meet you. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, them buggy whips. How bright were those? Good Lord. Yeah, I'm pretty sure yeah. that uh, we started off an alien invasion and they knew right where to come because of those things. Imagine everybody yeah. else that was just camping on that lake looking at stars. Yeah. <laughs> Why do those there stars keep moving the around the mountainside? <laughs> Pretty sure we signaled something in outer space with those. Uh, we had both West car and, and Ian's car hooked up on those, and that lit up the entire campsite, campground. Pretty sure the whole lake. Yeah. Oh, no, I'm 100% certain all the campers there that were fast asleep were super stoked about us rolling in when we did. <laughs> yeah, we yeah. Were not see, seeing the sun all of a sudden. Yeah, we were Especially quiet, hearing too. Cam scream after seeing the bear. Yeah! <laughs> and I'm out. <laughs> oh, very little Let's guy. Let's be real, guys. Cameron can't really see much of anything. It was probably someone's black lab running through. <laughs> it was Mike, guys. We already went over this. <laughs> it was in the adjacent campground. I'm sure they. Oh, were I had stoked. no idea how close they were until the morning. Yeah, they're like right the there. Dawn comes up. Like, oh, yeah. <laughs> And how about the fact that we like stopped at every campsite along the way? <laughs> hey, are you guys sleeping in there? You guys got room for two <laughs> or eight? Yeah, yeah, eight. So that was a good time. Uh, we all packed our cars into one <laughs> one campsite uh, that was meant for maybe two cars, yeah. and uh, uh, that was interesting getting set up at I don't know for it was like one forty five, two o'clock in the morning, something like that. I don't know, but it wasn't that late. No, it, was, it was like eleven thirty. Oh, that lake felt amazing. But we uh, we went and jumped in the lake, got cleaned up, and that felt great. Oh man! Damn, and I pulled in there during the daylight. It wasn't that late. Yeah, it was. We it got dark leave. fast up there. We didn't even leave uh, Pine till uh, after sunset. Yeah, but uh, how about that view when we woke up and the sun hitting that oh, mountainside man. and heck, the moon hitting that that cliff face right there. Yeah. Because we yeah, had, I think epic. we had close to a full moon, and it was epic. I would epic. say the moon coming Cam up got a full moon. when we were on our way <laughs> up the hill, and the moon was yeah, just starting to come up. I, I was worried there was someone driving on the dang road at one point in time. Yeah, it was pretty bright. It was huge. Um, but definitely, Trinity Lakes is definitely on my list of go back spots on this on this trip. Hundred um, percent. Take the family, spend a week up there. That'd be amazing. Uh, next morning, we we took the opportunity to get some filming in. Uh, took advantage of some of the epic views that we did not see on the night before. Speaking oh, of what Wes was saying, weren't we mostly we filming the us Rocks laughing at memes? We just skipped over the repair. Oh, we totally skipped over the the memes and the repair. Yeah, yeah, yeah no, I'm pretty sure <laughs> we just filmed us. Uh, yeah, we're missing Wes's shaft on this one. <laughs> hey, Wes, can you tell us about your shaft? I heard it. <laughs> <laughs> My you shaft got went, You went too hard? It was uh, not related to the mic incident. <laughs> but the, uh, I must say, you know, we had a bunch of debris on the road. And uh, my CV boot definitely wasn't hurt down in Pine. But by the time we got up to Trinity, uh, just doing a quick look around on the car, it looked like uh, the CV boot got torn pretty bad. So uh, fortunately, I had one with us and... Uh, able to do a repair thanks to Coop in the morning because uh, it turned out to be more than a one-man job at one point. 
at one at one point you both had hands on the shaft and and we're whacking on it. So we were giving that shaft hell. Yeah. And <laughs> the the tough part was, you know, the, the the amount of pounding we were doing on it. Yeah. Was causing further damage to the shaft. Oh, it and it uh, made us. You had to make sure that it was it. well lubed. Who was helping you with your shaft? We we had to work that shaft for sure. Yeah. And you know, it seemed to be like too big. Yeah. Even though it had fit before. Oh god. It was that. Uh, it was clearly not wanting to go in without a lot of lube, a lot of cleaning, and at least four hands on it. This reminds and me th- of and three and three cameras. It's pipe, it's pipe. <laughs> and a lot of memes <laughs> and a black couch. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it was my first Are time. You, you said it. <laughs> oh my gosh. Not from what I saw. Sorry, mom. <laughs> yeah. Ian, you said that was the start of pipe chasers right there. Right. Yeah, that's where the <laughs> just coming in with the gold, Brant. <laughs> Episode one. So, uh, yeah, so your t- your boot tour, uh, you had a full kit ready to go, and uh, you were running RCVs. Uh, so everything, no, no, on stock. Those were stock. Yeah. Oh, Coop is running RCV. Yeah. yeah. Coop's so, running RCVs. Uh, I'll probably look into them, but it turns out that they cost half of what the car does. Right. <laughs> so I'll probably stick with just buying extra. Yeah. Uh, stock, as it turns out that the stock X3 uh, axles are pretty good. Just the boot, you know, got torn. That could have happened with anything. But uh, speaking to that, you were prepared for that. You had the boot, you had the grease, you had the clamps, you had pretty much everything ready to go to manage that kind of trail side repair. And we've yeah. talked about loadout and we've talked about tools and we've talked about all that stuff. Uh, but, you know, carrying a spare axle like I do is one thing. That's just pop it in, pop it out, bang, you're on the trail. Whereas you're saying, I'm going to save all that weight and I'm going to save all that space and I'm going to take the tools and the components to fix what needs to be fixed and not worry about the rest of that. And there's three different size axles on the X3. The boot fits every single joint, but uh, you got a left front or right front and then both rears are the same. So you'd really have to take three axles if you wanted to have one for everything. Uh, what I'm going to do in the future is that when I uh, when I replace those two back axles, just, you know, I've got 3,400 miles in the car now. And uh, I'll probably replace both of those rear axles, save the good one, but I'm going to take it apart. And I'm going to save it as uh, an inner joint and an outer joint, which are uh, the same front to rear. So if you blew an actual joint in front, you'd have an inner joint. And if you blew an actual joint in back, you'd have an inner or outer joint. So that'll save the space, weight, and uh, allow you to take the the rare eventuality that you break one of them. Right, because normally when you break an axle, it's either you're shearing off the splines at the cup or you're taking... Or uh, doing a U-turn. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Speaking of which, I took my axle out on a U-turn. But, um, but it sounds cool right up until it doesn't. It does sound... well. <laughs> well, I thought. Never mind. I was going to say something about Mike's dog. Anyways, um, the uh, trail side repair went fairly well as far as once you got the the shaft inserted, uh, and you were able to um, wrap that up. Uh, and then we got back on the trail, started hitting the, hitting the mountains, and uh, it was pretty cool how it was all open uh, at that first leg there. Uh, north of Trinity was was fairly open. There wasn't a whole lot of trees and things in the way to. to obscure your view of the of the mountains and stuff so uh they weren't real big mountains at that point they were still fairly rounded off and and more like hills but uh pretty pretty awesome views there was that was that the day that we did the water crossing it was wasn't it i believe no no i'm pretty sure it was i'm pretty sure yeah yeah because that went into loman the water crossing was day three was it yeah yeah it's after yellow pine so uh, we started going north and uh, started hitting some more uh, aggressive tr- uh, terrain, started hitting some more uh, switchbacky stuff where up to that point it was, uh, once you got to the Trinity Lake, the peak area, it started getting twisty at night when we were up there and, and then the following morning. But it stretched out a little bit and then we started hitting the mountains, uh, started getting a little more aggressive and started seeing some trees finally. That was nice. Mm-hmm. Well, Bam Bam Coop and I had a little rally session towards uh, Deadwood Reservoir that was pretty good time. Bam Bam came in... Uh, I, I swear, dude, you're like your eyes 
when you come in after holding holding down the back of a, of a train <laughs> like that. Like, <laughs> dude, you get wrecked by dirt, man. Oh, <laughs> uh, 100%. Goggles or something. I need a pumper system. I need just a full on car built to myself. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> that was a fun ride though. Every, every right hand blind turn I made there, I was probably going like five miles an hour. Every open turn that I was on on the left where I could see we were, uh, we were hauling the mail. That was a good run. Yeah. It was super aggressive, super fun. That's, that's the stuff that I'm used to. That's, that's really got me pumped up just chasing and i mean half the half the time me and brant couldn't even see anything and he's left 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 and i'm like no nah, i think it's a right dude <laughs> <laughs> car dog coming in clutch <laughs> yeah, so we're shooting blind in the turns for sure so uh brant up to this point you know we were doing some pretty tame stuff and then we started getting more aggressive once we hit this point of the trip because we started getting a lot of the switch back and it was a lot of these turns yeah. uh what was your perspective now going into this experience now that you had a couple nights under your belt and you're really starting to see what this is turning into um i was just i was just like stoked and i i couldn't i couldn't keep a smile and grin off my face the whole time um it was just it was just cool to be in a rage i was like this is really what we get to do today and I was just really trying to soak in uh, every day the fun. I mean, the dust, like I'm used to the dust, but it's just, you know, at the slow rate and stuff with the amount of dust coming in in the trees, the dust was like really just sitting in the trees. So it's not like you even get in the desert, maybe you get like a wind flow and it's kind of, you know, real quick gone, the dust just sits there. Um, so I was just soaking in, just soaking in the beautiful scenery. Uh, like I said, I've always dreamed of of kind of going to rallies up in Washington or Idaho or somewhere where there's a lot of trees. So. I was just soaking that in. And then of course, when we were just tail to tail, just me, me, me up in the mm. mountains, I was just, I was stoked. I was like, let's, let's pun them, you know, and let's have some fun. So I was just really, uh, just trying to soak in, soak in the whole experience pretty much. What was the, uh, the expectation going into that day? We, we, we already had a couple days where we started late, really late into the morning. We didn't really have full days of riding kind of what was everybody's, ex- we had expectations of conquering. I think day two was supposed to be like, 400 miles or something like that and we didn't even come anywhere near near that no my expectation was i'm gonna go until ian stops like that's mm-hmm. it we stopped <laughs> a lot though we did do a lot of stopping um yeah i don't know what I was think, go ahead i think i think one of the stops like we sat there and we all looked at each other and we're like shit we're not we're not doing 400 miles today yeah <laughs> well, oh, I'm pretty sure everyone kind of had a feel for that yeah, after the yeah, day yeah. one when they realized, <laughs> yeah. okay, 400 miles. You start looking at your speedo and you start doing some simple math, and you're like, okay, we're averaging like 23 yeah. to 27 miles per hour right now. Well, and we're going to go 400 and miles. And that was the fast part of the trip. Yeah. Yeah. And we're trying yeah. to film 100%. as well, um, which adds a whole nother element of trying to, whole you know, element. the camera guys are trying to be as efficient as possible throughout the whole thing. But, you know, there's a certain aspect of it where it's like we got to log miles. So um, I think there's a, a definite need to set like a single goal, whereas we were doing like two or three different goals on this trip. And I think if you yeah. were to go out and do this trip on your own or with a group of your guys, you you might want to just hone in on one goal and then just make that one goal a thing everyone well, focuses on. Maybe that's where we went wrong. We shouldn't have said yeah. this. <laughs> <laughs> we, we had a lot going on at once. That way we and can't like let ourselves us. down when we don't set goals. We just kind of <laughs> go and when we feel like stopping and making food, we do that. Because I don't know about you guys, but I like food. <laughs> we we all know that we, we likes figured, food. Yeah, I I tried to educate these guys real quick on the whole food situation. <laughs> I, mean, for, I think overall though, I, I think that second day was some of the best roads we had though. Oh, they at were at the end of the trail there. Like when we me Coop and Ian, when we were just side by side, just banging off the side of the cliffs and it was dusty and i'm telling bam left and he's going right <laughs> and, you know like n- not listen to me i said uh, to hollywood where'd he go and hollywood said yeah. where'd who go where'd who I, go I think, I think that was some of the best some of the best travel. I mean, everyone kind of got separated because of dust but i just i think uh from a riding perspective that was some of the best tra- i mean it's just all graded fire roads and you could really get on it third you know 30 to 45 miles an hour maybe 50 but I, I just think some that for me that was like one of the highlights. Was, it was some of the best best and, train you could drive on. Like I want to go back, and I think a lot of people should experience it. And for clarity, just because we get a lot of feedback on this mm-hmm. on riding these trails fast and hard, you know, we had Ian out front uh, taking the head of this 
this caravan um and yeah. he was going hard but he would take every corner slow he would take yeah. every blind mm-hmm. spot slow and That's he was right. basically our point man to say hey just just so you guys know there's this coming up ahead but then all other times he was like hey I'm 30 miles into this and I haven't seen a single person, a single animal. Yeah. Hit it hard, have fun, right? Oh no, I was holding back a ways there at, at points just to let the dust down. Oh, for sure. I think that was the day I think day three was the day I was like, okay, I've had enough dust. I can hold back, I can take it easy and then get on it. Well, and then I would rip up and like ride someone's <laughs> It's like a back and yeah. forth. Like I want I want to take it easy and be yeah. out of the dust, but then I'm like, I want to go fast. <laughs> well, and you had a pumper, and I didn't, so I was just. We, we, I, we had the last day. Huh? Like, I, would, I would say the last day we didn't do much well, battling, but leading up into that, that's all we did. Oh dude. yeah, yeah. 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 Day, between, day three, day three was definitely the battle, dude. Between I mean, I, and Wallace, I, I mean, there were times my car hit eighty. <laughs> so, <laughs> it was legit. But yeah, no, yeah, on those blind corners and stuff like that, it's sketchy. we weren't messing around. We were showing that a lot of respect. We definitely don't want to hurt anybody. And there was a lot of radio yeah. comms too, a lot of safety. And Zach, I just want to point out like a lot of the driving we did, every, everyone on the trip was like a skilled driver. So that made, made the, a different experience. If you're a beginner, I wouldn't advise doing what we were doing. But being that everyone has a background of driving for a long time, that made a huge difference of why we could kind of keep the speed we kept throughout the whole. Mm-hmm. And oh, literally so every single oncoming car was called out and relayed to every single person in the group. I can't think of it until we got to like Avery. I can't think of a single car we passed at more than five miles an hour. Yeah. You know, you know it was not a, it was <laughs> never a surprise. Well, Wes, Wes was giving me a hard time for calling out your make model, Vin color Dude, <laughs> yeah. it wasn't like hey car coming direction like, they're traveling how many occupants 1978 chevy lt looks like a four by four but i think it's a conversion it's a <laughs> two-tone with the uh with a chrome bumper package and i think that the yeah. back one was probably have about a 15 percent tint All right drivers who are aquarius and likes long it. walks on the beach <laughs> Oh my goodness. Um, and so, uh, going into this, uh, everyone's cars had basically been gone through. We were all experienced drivers. We all have pretty high end machines, things like that. Uh, Cooper, you were ripping on a, on a pretty built X3 that you guys had built over at off-road power products. Mm -hmm. Um, and, uh, I had the turbo Ian's got his, uh, RC turbo, uh, the boys and, uh, Bam and Brant were rocking a, a 15, Razor 1000. Blacked yeah. out, baby. I'm not, I'm not gonna. I'm not gonna lie. I think ours was the most built for sure. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> it was almost unfair. Tangerine yeah. dream, baby. Color match Tangerine, everything. Yeah. So, um, you guys were rocking it, and but you, but you really couldn't go super fast on that thing when we were doing those long stretches. Um, oh, uh, what well, the, belt, <laughs> the belt would let them down yeah. at any I mean, moment I mean, in time. How many belts did we go through? <laughs> so I think we're on like belt three or four by this point. Yeah. Um, well, you you have to you have to say from the first day, which was you guys knocked out what four, uh two hundred and thirty miles or something the first day. Yeah, something like that. So yeah. from there to like pretty much the Canadian border, we had no belt. So that was super sketch. Like, <laughs> yeah, we still got like yeah. a thousand miles to go and we got zero belts. Knowing that those things blow belts like crazy. That was kind of sketch. And then Bam just put his foot I to think it. You were the only one. Did anyone it. else blow a belt? Did you, Zach? I, I, I found a chunk oh, out of my belt. Yeah. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> I remember that. <laughs> the razors. Is yeah. that what you're saying? The razors blew up. No, blew I wasn't going razor. there with it at all. Nope. Uh-uh. And, uh, and uh, uh, Ben, you were rocking the YXZ again, um, and you had just rebuilt uh, the transmission and everything. Um, you know, how was your car performing up to that point? Um, I had I had a little bit of uh, clutch slippage, but I think that was mostly um, operator error. But <laughs> for the most part, it did really well. Because you had installed uh, a, uh, an alternator kit on your car, because uh, we did. were trying to get as much power out of our cars for these film guys to be able to do their thing, and and for us to have a week long trip uh, of charging stuff. Um, Absolutely. And so, what? Uh, Coop's going all like gorilla on my microphones over here. Um, <laughs> Is there any uh, other way that Cooper goes though? <laughs> I don't yeah. think there's anything less. I don't. Straight I DK. was just adjusting it. It just. <laughs> didn't want to cooperate um and so you know we had a lot of um highway miles up uh on day three what what did that do to your car did that make any difference 
I think it increased the slippage in my clutches. Uh, when I got back, I did some, had some conversations with uh, Weller. Weller is the one that fixed me up on those parts and, and they got me dialed in and think we got, we got that problem. Got it all figured out. So uh, day three had a lot of, that was day three, right? We had a lot of highway going north to Yellow Pine. Was that highway or is that trail? That was that a was trail. All trail. Yeah, that was like the straightest trail I've ever been on, like in an overview. <laughs> but um, but uh, that was nice because it was a nice break from the t- stuff we were tearing up before. And then we made it all the way up to Yellow Pine uh, that night. Um, what about that campsite? We were on the, on the side of the river. Um, didn't really look like much. Looked like just a pull off on the road until we woke up. Yeah, that yeah. was rad. Like cruising the you know cruising those roads into the campsite, like watching the sun go down, be able to hold like a little bit you know higher speed mm-hmm. with it being a little bit more open and straight. And um, you're thinking only 238 more miles to go. Exactly. <laughs> exactly. No, that whole area was rad. Yeah, that, that was nice, like you said, being able to stretch out and and, and kind of to open up the machine. And, and the dust was really holding steady on that leg, though. So you had to be kind of careful. But if I remember right, there were some nice... Some Oiled nice sections. Some nice treated road sections there, yeah. Yeah, yeah um, no, that was... And, and that night was a little bit chillier than the last. Yeah, the temperature dropped okay. a bit. And... Uh, Wes came through for me on that one. He had an extra sleeping pad that I could put in my hammock so that I would create an warm. air barrier between you. Yep. Well, that was nice of Wes. Hashtag. I think that was the night they pulled off the steak. <laughs> yeah. Hashtag yeah, that was moving the first truck. Steak night. <laughs> that was steak night. Yeah. You guys had freaking like two inch th- stick. Thick steaks there. Get there. I felt like I was like my dog looking at me eating food, drooling. <laughs> yeah. I'm like, dude, I'm, I'm telling you, dude, this mountain house hits way harder than that steak. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> what do you think, Brant and I felt like eating it off of a cardboard box? <laughs> oh, you guys like, looked Aw. like you looked so <laughs> defeated. <laughs> didn't like, I? Hey, didn't I have leftover food that night that I let you guys have? Also, I don't remember. No, yeah, I that think was... West had leftovers, and then you ate the leftovers. And you're like, "Yeah, I'll take them." And I was like, <laughs> Wes did share potatoes, so I'm grateful for that. But yeah, I was like, "Those were good." Cow. Oh, we lost them. The uh, the ride into Yellow Pine was real interesting because we didn't actually make it all the way to Yellow Pine. We made it to that ice hole campground, and you guys had done the drone flights on the way in, and so I hung back with Bam and Brant, and you guys had a you know, 15, 20 minutes, you know, head start on us while we packed everything up and got rolling again. And we got to have a little fun on the way in there too. Yeah, that was a good time uh, too. I mean, we were averaging like 35, 40, that whole, like we blitzed it back. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And so you guys were in clear air. So you could run as hard as you wanted. And then I was just kind of tucked in behind you and like, nope, stay to the right. (laughs) I can't stay to the right, I'll die. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) No, definitely as long as as long as you were staying like you either needed to be right on their tail or like three miles back. Yeah, well, we were like in an echelon. So I let them go up in front and then I got off to the left. It was just, you know, we were able to do that. Yeah. And then they just burp right in front of me around like a hairpin. Just like, oh, <laughs> you know, just immediate white out conditions doing 40. And uh, so then I started turning on my lights. Brant comes on the radio. Don't do that. <laughs> yeah. Like we're being chased by the sun. Yeah. So so your car, you run uh, probably what? A hundred thousand lumens of Baja design. <laughs> It's uh, we did the math. It's 108 forward facing. Yeah, get with it, Zach. Yeah, it's 108. I'm scared Jesus. of the dark. I was oh. scared of the dark. No, I think the dark's <laughs> scared of you. Yeah, I don't know. There's no dark when we're there. Waking up in the next morning, we went and had a uh, breakfast in Yellow Pine. Mm-hmm. The longest breakfast. <laughs> and that, yeah, that was like a three hour. The adventure. second edition to In Comes John Cena. <laughs> third now the first one oh yeah that oh, was the third we totally skipped over cargo strap. <laughs> he had a, he had the a second, follow-up the second was him tripping over the rock up on the rail yeah. while i was fixing my shit oh, yeah. i didn't know he tripped all i hear is <laughs> <laughs> yeah. well boom on the ground oh man 
Yeah, I had a few a few times there. I just yeah. ended up on the ground on my back. I think the, it became the most a prophetic a thing anybody said though is when we were ordering the food, the lady behind the counter goes, "Hey, um, that table's kind of janky." <laughs> Like, okay, yeah, got it. We know how tables work. Yeah, we have you know, 600 pounds of man <laughs> on, on, one, <laughs> on one side, first of all. Let's just go through the physics class on that one. Hey, let's we got 600 pounds of dudes, three dudes, one side. Whoa, Not that sounds small. like a meme. Yeah, but let's just be I clear. Slow motion, too, because they. I think, Cam, you were the last one to sit down, right? No, Zach was. I, I was. They were sitting down. Uh, Zach figures. I was. So, <laughs> I was one <laughs> bite into bacon, bro. One bite. It was just like yeah. this. It was like was boom, up. and then it just goes. <laughs> and it was and it slow enough. Fly. I'm like, why and is my orange juice all inverted? Their food and all their laptops. <laughs> It was slow enough that we could literally catch our laptops and, and electronics coming down the table while at but the same time, food. but e- while at the same bacon. time watching the food come apart midair and land on us. <laughs> yeah, I think I got six or seven more bites out by the time I slammed. <laughs> <laughs> it was like but, camera uh, was Fruit pretty, Ninja. My camera was pretty wrecked once it fell off the table. I picked it up and there's a strip and an orange juice syrup, bacon. So I, I, bad. I felt really bad. Everybody. He had his, uh, his camera just coated. And yeah. Uh, yeah, that was no fun. So I think it was you are did we do you you didn't eat any of your breakfast after that right like no Brant you had a bunch of your breakfast I had I had one bite into the bacon when I got launched with Cam no <laughs> I was I, I think we were literally timing our bacon bites I was one bite yeah. yeah so yeah. so we had waited for forty five minutes forty five to an hour for this breakfast did it again yeah, but it was one lady because there was one gal in the back of a kitchen in a small a town and yeah. uh, we had finally gotten around to getting our food and we went to sit down. With because we were transferring files and whatnot, trebuchet, yeah. and uh, we yeah. we quickly realized. Hey, Graham. Hey, hey, Coop. Yo, I think now's a great time for a Farley impersonation of you. Remember that one? Time oh shit! We started leaving it. That eight was eight. some of the funniest <laughs> shit I've heard the whole time. <laughs> <laughs> well, we'll see if we can't bring him into the mix. <laughs> <laughs> it sounded like Chris Farley was on the radio. Yeah, you remember when we planned on leaving at eight o'clock? That was awesome. <laughs> that was awesome. <laughs> oh man. So so we had waited forever for and we we waited waited for waited for forever for gas, for food, for for whatever because it's a small community, small town. One pump. One pump. You know, just it's a it's just the way it goes at that in those communities. It it's a, it takes a while. Mm. And we and they weren't even up until eight nine, or nine. Nine for gas, eight for food. Right. And so just the small communities, <laughs> that's how they operate and, and it took forever. And then we uh I decided to shovel our videographers' foods into their faces by sitting on the table. Yeah. Uh and to be clear, this table was not like No, it was janky, like she said. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, Afterwards, but she when she happily charged us for forty more dollars worth of food. <laughs> yeah. yeah, and then you guys go and order more food. <laughs> we oh. sat there for another hour. Yeah. But it was uh, amazing though. Best it, orange juice of my life. Best orange juice. It was. <laughs> the food was really good. And it was like powder orange juice, too. It was yep. trippy. <laughs> so we eventually got out of there mm-hmm. uh, and made our way uh, continuing north. Um, Dude, that first turn out of uh, out of Yellow Pine, where we were going along that river for a minute. Awesome. That was the first real jaw dropper for me. Like, oh, yeah. everything up to that point was... Uh, like, yeah, yeah, yeah. Everybody says Idaho is beautiful. I'm not going to be surprised when it's beautiful. But you turn around and you're just like, there's a river right there. And it wasn't like anything keeping you out of the river. It was right along that beautiful section before we started really ascending into the first mountains. Yeah. I thought that was jaw dropping. That was your first po- postcard you started moment. started the whole thing in Yellow Pine, that wouldn't have been the end of the world either I, I don't know man dropping into anderson reservoir the drone shots that that you guys got were freaking we were epic. on a road I, right but it was still pretty dang epic but i know what which you're means about. that anderson reservoir was beautiful but as far as actual crazy beautiful driving oh, yeah. it started in yellow pine well the water was the water looked incredible the the rocks the type of rocks, the trees, the fact that it was all right there—it was—it was pretty wicked. 
And it's it not really that, was. It's not that there was water or rocks or trees. It was like it's it's the it's the way that the postcard looks like just yeah. extending to the side of you for miles upon miles as you drive. Mm-hmm. And it doesn't stop. It's not like oh, you see this cool view for a second. Like you go to the Grand Canyon, you know, you can see an overlook. And then you drive back here in the middle of the desert for, you know, 30 miles, come back out to an overlook. This was like you're driving along the postcard. I think it was about that time that I also started realizing I got to stop looking at everything to the side of me and start focusing on the turn ahead. Because I think I'm pretty sure that's where I went off the trail the first time. (laughs) (laughs) Brant, are you looking for your weed? (laughs) <laughs> no, I'm trying to send an email right now. <laughs> Busted. I'm going to have to dip off the a little bit. Uh, I, fell asleep. I fell asleep actual twice on the way into Deadwood. Like the pace had dropped so much. The oh, dust yeah. was so bad. I'm just sitting there. Like you'd think that you couldn't fall asleep turning left, right, left, right, except it's left, right. Left. Wow, it's very swoopy. Time. Right. We, we yeah. should have been up in the front with us because we were waiting 20 minutes on you guys to show up. I was I was 30 feet from Mike, who was 30 feet from Zach. Yeah. Yeah, we were yeah. pretty tight in the back. Coop and I and Bam, we were hauling the mail. You guys were you guys were out there. It was your guys' 60 watts were starting to stretch their their distances there between the two of you. L- laws may have been <laughs> so uh they heard me loud and clear. <laughs> so it was actually really to, to speak to that it was really nice to have uh at least two cars we had more than two cars but that had you know 50 plus watt radio systems that could stretch out between the group and the guys with the smaller radios could be in the middle to pick up the crosstalk uh i can't stress enough how much communications makes the trip for these kind type of deals uh washington we had broken comms uh it made things stressful and hard um you know uh you know bam talking about the uh the comms how was working with a group of guys on a trail like this this run and gun scenario compared washington to idaho when you had actually crosstalk between everybody in the group yeah i mean definitely communication is definitely key in something like this i know for i know for every shoot that i do whether it has some distance between like the client or the athlete whatever you want to put it as i mean i give them a radio and it's like hey it's so much easier instead of trying to wave your hand and trying to grab their attention through that so i mean having that communication was definitely key i know i know for us it was a little tough i mean we were on handheld so when we're doing 35 40 down there i'm having a handheld like this and i'm like what do you say huh? yelling at brant and whatnot and it's like i'm going uh, I don't know. <laughs> yeah so for the I love mean, of god what did he just say <laughs> hey, hey, for the record, for the record nobody can tell the difference between you guys when you guys do a radio call like i don't know who the hell i'm talking to this I, it was, <laughs> <laughs> yeah i mean that, well, was that's wonderful. all we heard so yeah. it was like that's i think that was one of the biggest things why we kind of stayed on i mean whoever was in front like we stayed really close to him because I mean, when certain turns would come up, I mean, we really didn't know where we were going half the time. Yeah, it was just I mean, kind of yeah. play it by ear. But, I'm surprised uh, you, you thought know, you were nowhere where you were going half the time. Yeah, like that seems um, like a big number. <laughs> I mean, I wouldn't even have a we didn't have a guy or a GPS, so we had no no like really no comms and no GPS. So definitely, I mean, comms is what makes it. I would say you have to have have to have good comms on something like this. Yeah, I mean, we had a saying weird. in the. Uh, in the SEAL teams that everybody always says practice makes perfect, but it's just not true. Perfect practice makes perfect. If you're practicing poorly, uh, it, it really doesn't help. You're just building in some bad habits. Comms are important, but legitimately good comms are important. Yeah, good Having comms. shit comms is barely better. In fact, it can uh, be yeah, a lot yeah. worse because you're under the uh, impression that you're making comms and I know, you know that. Or that you've got the tools. Bad I, comms honestly cause stops really because if you can't hear people, you're literally pulling over and just getting face yeah. to face. So, yeah, and yeah. I know that like going into a, a ride, having comms tested is a huge part of that. I mean, like with with Ian's, we had an experience on the Washington Trail where the comms weren't working great, and then we had Ben's car that wasn't working great, and we went into this testing everything, and Ben was fine with it, and then Ben. You know, your comms, you know, kind of broke out a little bit. Don't mess with him. He's taking down (laughs) the 14-year-old next door. (laughs) He's playing words with friends. Come on. 
uh, but Ben, you, your comms kind of started breaking down too, and to a point where you could only listen really uh, for the most part. So, what was the experience going into you know the second half of this trip, not really being able to talk back? What was the kind of changes? He's Turned like, my it was perfect. On. It was fantastic. <laughs> it was fantastic. Not having to worry about communicating with anybody was like the top, top of my my <laughs> list for things that I wanted to do. <laughs> but uh, but you stayed up pretty much in the front or the middle, uh, the front or the middle, depending on which trail we were on. Um, and so you could yeah. kind of just pick up everybody else's banter back and forth. Well, I had two things going for me. One, um, people didn't argue with me when I pushed my way to the front. And two, I had a pumper system so I could stay within sight of people pretty easily without without eating too much garbage. Right. And so, uh, Coop, you're, this was the first trip you had run the pumper system on your car, right? Oh, yeah. How was that experience? Uh, it was a, a game changer, but uh, <clears throat> I did realize that uh, some of those things still they still require quite a bit of maintenance and we had enough dust that, uh, I think everything on everyone's rig required some sort of maintenance. So after a while, it just got to a slow trickle for airflow, which was still nice. But every <laughs> now and then there'd be like a poof of dust that would come through. It would and, make its way through. And it would just be locked in my helmet with me. <laughs> so that was, that was an absurd amount of dust. I can't extra stress enough how much dust we've all been through on this trip. Oh yeah, <laughs> it was just uh-huh. uh, crazy to even think about that. And um, you know, if you have a clear helmet and all of a sudden you go, <laughs> you're dealing with a poof. <laughs> Wait, what? <laughs> what just happened? Um, uh, so going into this half of the trip, was this where your your car started to kind of uh, to burp at you? Uh, yeah, I think that uh, we were getting a, a little bit more spirited there. On that, uh, actually, no, this wasn't it. It was. It was just before the water crossing. That's when you started noticing it? Yeah, that's, that's I think, when, when the issues started to uh, show themselves, cause, uh, which was the next day, I think, after this. I think that was day four, right? <clears throat> yeah. Which, Every, everybody's texting their girlfriends right now, so. They are. Oh, no, I'm looking at the... Uh, <laughs> I'm trying to figure out which was which day. That was after, like, three days of... Uh, our Donkey Kong over here just pushing this car absolutely 150%, almost <laughs> flying off the side of mountain. So I was surprised it lasted four days. <laughs> now, to, you did go off the side of a mountain on purpose at one point uh, near that time frame, too. I did hang a tire. It was, uh, it was exhilarating. <laughs> that was a hairpin turn that just kind of like showed up, and it was one of those like, well... If I hit the brakes, nothing good will come of this. So I better just like <laughs> power through, power through, and root. when in doubt, tire, I felt the tire pop down over the edge, and it just kind of kept uh, hanging on, and we were good. It was it was pretty awesome. And I think at one point you also just deviated from the trail and cut down through the mountain at that point. Too. Oh yeah, that was uh, just getting to the uh, fifty uh, fifty whatever inch bridge. I think just before that, I saw everyone <clears throat> cutting across. I saw him switch back ahead, and I was like, well, this looks kind of cool here. Let's go through here. Pew! <laughs> right off the edge. But it was fun. Just Duke's a hazard off the side of the mountain. Yeah. <laughs> when we got through that. First- yeah, so Haven was where the Huckleberry Shakes were, right? Yeah, that was just before the uh, the the trip up the hill where I hurt the engine. Yeah, when we got through that 50-inch bridge, that was uh, that was the first like sense of relief I felt on the entire trip because – there's a, uh, in the dual sport community, there's a lot of chatter online about whether or not they have concrete blocks. And if you're under 50, if you're over 50 inches, you're not getting through there. So to see that bridge clear was honestly the biggest obstacle on the trip that I thought we would have to face. And w- when it was clear, I was pretty freaking pumped. Yeah. And in retrospect, I walked across that whole river right there where Coop went over at lunch. Yep. We could have driven across. Yeah, for sure. That's where Coop went and played at that gravel pit. Yeah. I needed food. I took out his motor. <laughs> I needed food bad. But uh, yeah, we stopped. So where did we? Where was it that we stopped for Huckleberry Shakes? Um, Haven Hot Springs. Uh, yeah. That's I want to say that we called it Loman, but Loman. Uh, we actually had to go up further to get premium. Yeah. Right, because we had stopped and they didn't have the gas we wanted, so we, we made the extra trek up, up north a little bit, which was actually on the way. Yep. <laughs> which ended up, we got gas at Loman, but uh, 
Haven was where we got the uh, Huckleberry shakes. Gotcha. So I had I had taken a few moments when we got to the actual fuel stop and went through and checked my oil level. My oil level was good, so I hadn't used any oil between the start and there. Like everything was fine. The crankcase ventilator wasn't doing anything crazy. I wasn't burping anything out. Nothing crazy. And then, uh, and then we started out of that gas station, and it was like immediately climbing. Really, and it was a lot of fun. But it was it was <laughs> steep, and we covered a lot of elevation. And I was hard on it for a long time because I think that was wasn't that the first time that I was like right behind you, Ian. Uh, it might have been, yeah, yeah. I, I want to say uh, right out of Loman, we had about a thirteen mile drive to that. Well, they they said thirteen mile drive for the water crossing. I was up over fifteen by the time we actually did it. Yeah, yeah. That ascent out of Loman. Oh yeah. That whole thing where you just literally didn't lift. You could see all the way up the yep. trail and just connect left to right to left to right. Oh yeah. Woo! Oh, it was. <laughs> it was awesome, but we were on it hard i was gonna say that was about the time where i was like okay he's not joking around today he's he's in the gas today yeah and uh yeah i'm pretty i'm i'm about 99 percent certain i've had something going on every weekend since we got back so i haven't been able to tear it apart but i think it went lean and it took out rings and pistons yeah so it, it started just losing power and it didn't really lose power but the crankcase pressure sure went up gotcha and who made a who made that tune <laughs> they know exactly who they are <laughs> will i be using them again no dude everybody knows who they are and you don't have to say anything yeah we all know this i actually missed out on some shots in there because we were pushing tempo up above and uh you know cam would call something out bam bam would call something out and we'd stop you guys at the other side of a canyon to catch you guys coming in and i'm looking at that drive back i'm like i'm not driving back to go be a part of that shot that's about <laughs> a minute endeavor so but no that was epic that was a it's it's awfully cool that was probably one of very few spots outside of the magruder where you could look across a canyon and see the group yeah and know that in actual trail miles that you probably got about a three mile gap or more so uh, was that about when we lost our drone? Uh, no, 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 no. That was way later. Oh, that was later. Yeah, it fell oh, off. Okay. A, it fell off a mountain. <laughs> Went into a tree. Fell off a mountain. There was something, something crazy there. The proximity alarms weren't functioning. Wasn't that dropping into uh, Riggins? Yeah, that was. Uh, I'm pretty sure the French Creek grade. Gotcha. So we made our way up the mountain. And that's when we hit the rotting water crossing, right? Yeah. 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 And, uh, and this wasn't some epic, like huge water crossing. No, this wasn't it, like South America ris risk your life to go across thing. It was made out to be that it was. Yeah. But I think that's just because of the, the venture bike, you know, perspective on that. Sure. Uh, but even at the gas station, they were telling us big rock, don't go center, all that stuff. And right. I, I don't think anyone, perfect. <laughs> we, <laughs> we, from the footage we've all uh, seen so far that we, we kind of all just went dead center and it's yeah. just an instagram flex for sure <laughs> and the boys got their shorts wet and got their flip flops off and mm -hmm, mm -hmm. got out in the water it was pretty awesome but it, how how refreshing was it just to hit water like you know you've talked about jumping in the lake and cleaning off but, oh yeah but just hitting water and feeling... i immediately immediately regretted getting stoking though because as soon as we got back on the road covered. it was like being a fucking sugar cookie it was like yeah you were covered <laughs> yeah <laughs> That's not yes. mud, Tommy. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, we made it through there. We did some filming there. We made our way up. And then uh, then what happened after that? We went through the French Creek grade, had to pass Bergdorf. Yeah. Because they didn't have, they weren't open. Into Warren. And then at the, uh, at the Manning Bridge, turn left and go to Riggins. So Bergdorf was was marked as a fuel stop, right? And they were yeah. not open. And they were not open. And from what I saw of Bergdorf, I wouldn't trust it being open when you ride these trails. No, not right now. That place is, is pretty awesome, though, otherwise. Yeah. Yeah, normally. I think it's for sale, actually. The whole the whole area? Yeah, all that's privately owned. Gotcha. I'm, I am sure that uh, it's probably... A lot of these little places are probably taking somewhat of a hit given the current 
Which is is interesting to me because now is like the perfect time, I think, for people to get out there and try. Them. Right, and there's a yeah. lot of a lot more people out there buying cars and doing stuff too. So, right. yeah, Riggins Riggins actually uh, identified the second worst time on the entire trip because Coop was talking about street tacos and COVID took out street <laughs> tacos. Mm-hmm. No, we were late. That's what Fuck. took out the street tacos. <laughs> like they were closed because they're small towns, so they're like, "Oh, it's five o'clock. Everything's closed now." <laughs> <laughs> that that is something to, to take into consideration. These small these small towns don't open early and they don't stay open late. No. So if you're if you're looking to do miles uh, like we were doing, you have to plan for that because you're just gonna have to bring everything with you. That was some- on the flip side. I'm also willing to bet that if you phoned them ahead of time and said, "We've got." A one thousand dollar gas sale tomorrow morning <laughs> at seven in the morning. They would right. open. They Pretty would sure they'll open. open. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But we were all focused on the tacos. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, I must say, uh, if you don't have food, plan your stops accordingly. Like me and Bam Bam, we would just stock up because sometimes you get to a gas station and or the city was closed, so just. Stock up on your uh, just on your yogurt food. and cheese puffs and, and your Kyles. <laughs> Gotta get your Kyles, baby. I had I've, yeah. we had we had steaks and fries that night. As I recall, you guys ate, got in on that action. I had yeah, a, we had a little I chicken in the parking lot. That's what I had, and I got to munch some of uh, Cameron's fries, if I remember right. I didn't. I didn't eat. Much. I also had a steak that night. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. That I had it in Elk City. Yeah, that was a trail. Oh Going my god, that was gorgeous. gorgeous. Yeah. That, so, uh, well, and we left. When we left there, we got into the trees in a section that was, it was like dense cedar with these mm-hmm. like swoopy, um, flowy corners that all had these like really cool drops. Like you'd be sideways on these drops going into these corners. And it was so killer from yeah. there. And that sunset, as I recall, that evening was, was pretty, pretty banging. Yeah, so uh, basically what happened is the BDR goes from Riggins, it goes up an ascent, uh, and that road is super wide, and it goes, I mean, it's it's fairly steep, you know, the cars don't notice it, but it is fairly steep, and then the road connects to this uh, forest service road called 694, and 694, when it's out, there's a diversion to get back up to the main body of the BDR, that's what we took. The 694 uh, diversion is what Wes and uh, Wes and Mike took. And I actually took it this last weekend. So I would say 643, just so you know, 643. But uh, yeah, that that trail is probably about 10 miles to. Yeah, I'd say somewhere around 10 miles, give or take a mile or two of if honestly, there were spots in that trail coop. I, I think you'd have been, you'd have had to make some plan to get planning to get that car around. It is very very narrow in some spots, sketchy in some spots, like uh, uh, unforeseen logs and stuff that can take you out. Mm-hmm. But it's all clear cut logging. Once you get to the top of it, it is super powdery, super slick, super narrow, and literally about the only plot on the entire BDR. Like you have some uh, a couple little hill shoots and. The- <coughs> So many diversions off that 643 trail that all reconnect to, BD, to the BDR that it's like legit, probably one of the coolest play areas that I could think of. I want to go back and just. Yeah, explain. we were getting gaps in a bunch of spots. And I'll tell you what, I led the way through there on, on the actual route that we had. You guys, like I said, or you said, stayed left. We turned right, went in in 643. And uh, there was fresh, fresh sawdust where somebody within the last day or so had made the trail wide enough for us to go. Somebody had, it was definitely the one spot of the trail where we thought we were going to need the, uh, chainsaw. the chainsaw out because it, I guarantee it was impassable that time the week before. And that's a shout out to all the guys that are part of the, the clubs and whatnot that go and maintain these trails. Uh, you know, it's hard for us to imagine how much work goes into keeping these things. I mean, Idaho's of trails are immaculate mm. compared to like Washington or some of these other states. And, and so if you can support these groups or be a part of these groups to help maintain these trails, you're going to benefit exponentially from just being part of that community, but also knowing the trails are being kept the way that they should be. Every right. single logging road that we were on in Idaho 
was better than the 15 as soon as you get into California. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I got to tell you, man, Idaho is ob is absolutely protective of these trail systems too. Like, yeah, and, the and they were we're doing this all wrong. They're all terrible. Well, all all the <laughs> <laughs> all the business owners that we saw that we came into contact with were elated. They were so stoked we were there. They were wanting to know what our story was. All the locals, the locals don't want those those. Uh, those trail systems to get out because they don't want them overrun by people and stuff. And, and it's gotten to the point where my DMS actually blow up quite a bit with people whining about that. And you know, you know, the slogan Virginia is for lovers. I'm going to start doing Idaho is for Karens. Cause that's like legitimate. <laughs> who, I mean, my DM is blowing up just like, Oh, next, next thing you know, we're going to have a Starbucks up on top of burnt knob because all these Seattle people, I'm like, you know, there's a lot of business owners in these small towns that like that money and count on that money. So, so let's just go with their opinion. You know, the trick is, is stay on the trail. Right. Okay. Every single one of those offshoots for the BDR, you could have spent a month driving around the local area and never hit the same thing twice on every single one of those stops. If they can bring money, resources, activity into those stops on this trail, nobody should give a shit. You know, it's the people who say, wow, you know, this is really nice in Yellow Pine. Let's come here for a month. I don't see anybody doing that. So uh, we made our way up through there and then we made our way into uh, heading towards uh, the Magruder run, right? That was basically the start of the Magruder run. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. Out of Florence, you went into the Elk City. Right. And then we found out that you need to carry Octane Boost with you wherever you go on these trails. Yeah. I was surprised that they didn't have 91 in Elk City. I, I was running their garbage gas and it, it really wasn't a big problem. You just stay out of the turbo and, and the X3 will eat that 87 octane. Like if you can keep out of boost. Wrong. Wrong. <laughs> As we found out, Wes, uh, it knows very well that it depends on your tune and how your, your machine's built, uh, whether it's going to accept Mike's garbage fuel or not. Stock and he had the same codes I did. We just must've gotten a bad slug in Avery. Yeah. yeah. So, I mean, this, I mean, the XP 1000 was like, it was juiced after that. It was running the best <laughs> yeah, <ever>. doggy. <laughs> oh, oh, oh. <laughs> <laughs> I think one, uh, one, one of the people I found is like, yeah, those things will run on milk. Yeah. <laughs> but not on belts. But one of the care I'm, to uh, add any more to that one, Brent? Oh, uh, I was going to say, one today, we put like two and a half bottles of octane boost so we were like we're like 150 <laughs> proof baby we were juiced <laughs> straight moonshine <laughs> shooting flames yeah, could, yeah, could be of, the reason for smoke in so many belts <laughs> we, uh, we targeted this campground called poet creek and that's literally where the production started to take place like i i kind of guaranteed that it, uh bam bam brant and cam this roughly about this 50 mile 60 mile window where we would get some pretty epic footage. And that's kind of where that started. And just as a frame of reference, that's where I stayed. I stayed there uh, last Saturday night or something like that. So we woke up at eight o'clock local and we were on trail by nine where we parked on the other end of the Magruder on the other side of the Magruder. We were on trail by nine and we got to that spot. I want to say it was about 1040. We were freaking flying, dude. Like, I think I did the math on it. We were holding like a 43 mile an hour average over the Magruder. It was freaking nuts. But there was nobody up there. So wow. we can do that. Yeah, we really cool. put down some speed. That's where things got interesting, I think. That's where I was like, mm -hmm. well, if we're going to put an exclamation point on this engine, let's do it here. <laughs> <laughs> well, that was the end of your engine. Yeah. yeah. Yep. Yeah, that's where Coop nailed the uh, nailed the pin in the coffin there on that one. Yep, yep. But uh, we made our What'd way. What'd you do? <laughs> What'd you do, Richard? What's the matter? <laughs> God, it's so good. You're gonna get me demonetized. Yeah. So rad. <laughs> um, but we made our way up to Burnt Knob on that on that stretch, and so that was rad. pretty good. Yeah. So. What rad. were your thoughts on that, Cam? Um, it was kind of cool to kind of see like a little bit more technical driving. I know from like a filming and photo standpoint, um, it was nice to, you know, get everyone out of the cars, you know, and get some filming in. Um, I know not to pat the camera guys on, on the back, but I felt like we were really efficient at stacking shots and we were flying up the burnt knob and all through the Magruder, um, getting a lot of really mm -hmm. good footage through there. So, Hey, bam, you, you know, 
comparing the the uh, the scenery scenery that you saw in Washington and comparing it to Idaho up to that point, and then seeing you know the lookout at Burnt Knob and and all that vista, you know, kind of what was your your viewpoint on that part of the trip? Yeah, I mean, it definitely felt more like Washington, just with like I guess Washington was a super elevation constantly, where you're coming around these corners and you're just seeing this epic view. I mean, during that trip. I, I swear like half the trip, my phone was out like side of the window, just filming stuff. I mean, it was super epic. And then getting up to the top of the Magruder grind. I mean, it was, it kind of felt exactly like that when you're at this peak and literally in a 360 circle, all you see for miles, like as far as I can see is just land. Um, it was definitely epic. And like to kind of touch bases on uh, what Ian was saying, this is definitely the day that it really picked up production wise. I know, I know the first two days we got footage and it was good stuff. We got a lot of solid audio to start off the trip, but then it got, I know for me personally, um, driving the thing, you kind of get set into where you're so focused on driving the, like driving the train that the whole filming kind of goes out the window and you're just so, I mean, you're in this, you're seeing all this epic view and I know Brant and I kind of talked to them like, hey, we need to we need to definitely get this action. We have perfect audio. Now where's the action and the visuals to support this? So I think as a team, I mean, from drivers to filmers, this was definitely the day where, hey, pull over, drop us off. We're hiking for a couple of minutes and just come by, by us. We're going to redo that for a couple hours. And that was definitely the day that we knocked out the most footage, I believe, which yeah, was uh, good. Film, I mean, filming, I think the Magruder, it was one of the hardest things we had to film. Um, I mean, I got to drive that day, uh, which was cool. Um, I thought I did a great job up the rocks. Like, cause he, you know, he was like, put it in four low, kind of cruise. And, and there was a point that was, we were like going so slow until bound. I was like, why? And then we hit like the spot and it was like this straight steep and, and just rocky. And um, you really got to take care of your car knowing you still have five, 600 miles to go. But from a filming aspect, it was hard because you, you couldn't you couldn't stop anywhere mm. and film because it was on the side of a cliff so that made it kind of hard because we really wanted to capture how nasty of a terrain it was and how big the rocks were and you you go off on the one rock and you bump one you're off on the side of the cliff and you're falling thousands of feet and you're dying so it just sucks and you're dying car. <laughs> dying baby because you couldn't you couldn't pass and film. did you die so i wish we would have done a better job of, of capturing it but in the time we started to put down miles and I, it's just one of those things like how do you film this with without getting hit and letting the cars go by you know so that was like the downside but other than that that we stacked a lot of clips uh production value went up on all three of our our ends and uh we were just able to get some some really cool different terrain because it wasn't just fast graded roads through the mountains it was a lot of rocky stuff and just epic epic scenery does ben hey, want to add ad. anything about um the falling off of the the cliff, <laughs> almost dying. <laughs> <laughs> the pucker factor. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Section was very high on that section, and uh, that kept that pure that vortex kept me from doing exactly what Brant was discuss discussing. But I wanted to yeah. do a shout out to the media guys that w Ian and I discussed the challenges that were going to happen to you for you guys because of the fact that none of us had really been on on this entire trip before. So we had, other than the Magruder Trail, where we knew some I, some some specific places that we knew we could get you some good video, that um, by this day, you guys were really sta starting to get things dialed in and starting to recognize when when those things all started to come together and, and make some stuff happen and, and still get in a ton of, ton of miles without, mm -hmm. um, you know, getting what you needed and getting what we needed in order to, to finish the trip. Yeah. yeah but at the beginning, Coop could have said, Hey, look, there's Bigfoot. And Ian would have gone, don't worry about it. There's plenty of them in the group. Yeah, <laughs> right. But it's fucking Bigfoot. Don't worry. It, no, there's another, another Bigfoot on the Magruder. <laughs> don't worry. There's going to be another Bigfoot. I would say well, I that. Think that it, I, go ahead, Ben. I think it definitely took like uh, those first couple of days to kind of all come together. And I think that is the official day that everyone from drivers to the filmers all came together and were like, hey, we have a mission. We have to, one, accomplish miles plus capture it. So, I mean, all of us working that together and I know with Ian leading, he had, he knows the vision that we're looking for. I mean, he knows the good content that it's like, it's easy to capture, but it's something, 
hey, hit the spot where we can capture multiple shots at once instead of doing one shot, drive for 10 minutes, do another shot. I mean, that just eats up time. And with this amount of miles, I mean, we would never accomplish that. So I think it was definitely the day we all came together, which was for my aspect for being a filmer, it was super cool to see everything happen like that. Yeah, I think yeah. there was definitely a moment once we got off of Burnt Knob and started getting on some of those those fun little side trails and, and seeing that open up a bit, I feel like we all started to kind of click into our little spots. Like we all mm-hmm. kind of, instead of trying to figure out everybody else's jobs, we figured out what ours were and we kind of all kind of started clicking together uh, like an actual Legos piece. So um, I, I think that's kind of the turning point that, you know, some of us had some stress about how to get things done and how to how to work with, you know, this team and that team and whatever. Um, and I think at that point, it's kind of where we all kind of just let go of all that stress and just figured out where we were working the best at and kind of started move, greasing the wheel and moving forward. And then uh, and then the X3 died. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, then, so back up just a second. What, what Cooper was alluding to was the fact that Cooper was behind me and I, we came across a, a Chevy pickup, Dodge pickup, some pickup and it needed by me. And so <laughs> sure. A Chevy blue interior. <laughs> so <laughs> I tried to get off the trail some, and of course there's like a sheer drop on one side of me. And, and, uh, I went over, I, I scooted a little too far off to the side and, uh, dumped my tires off of the cliff and, and, uh, sat there for a little while knowing that Cooper was behind me at some point that maybe at least he could, could, uh, use all of those horses he had under his hood to, to help get me out of the situation. <laughs> Cause there was, how, there was some puck going on. How was it going up the Magruder with the smaller tires? Being at the rocks were like the size of your tires. Was it a little? Oh, I didn't even <laughs> feel them. Cooper <laughs> <laughs> didn't feel a thing. He just, of course, he only yeah, hit Cooper, the tops of them. He was hauling yeah. so, ass up the thing. But for yeah. you, Ben, was it was it a little bit more difficult having the smaller tires, or? Oh uh, you know? well, I had a different set of tires this trip than I've had in the past. Uh, previously on that trail system, I ran the Bighorns. And there was a sizable difference in both traction and, and ruggedness. I lost a big horn on that, on that trail system. The first time that I went through and this time mm. the, the casings on those Kanadis were so much better that, that I, I, I never felt wanting. I, I seemed like I was always having traction as far as the height difference. The only place that I really noticed it was, was on burnt knob and being a Yamaha, I have to hit that stuff at a bit of a, the bit of a momentum so yeah i was bouncing around a little bit and i'm sure that's probably what bent my control arm but um i yeah I finished the rest of my part of the trip on that bent control arm so i didn't have the same problems that ian did on his on the washington run so you went from i think it was yeah, what, no, we 27s were... or 28s up to 22s it... <laughs> were you rocking 22s on that <laughs> no, no I, keep them clean Dubs, I had baby. the opportunity to go to 29s, but because of uh, the clutching that I changed and the alternator and all the adjustments that I made to the car, I, I opted to go ahead and stick with the 27s, but going with the same, the the 14 wides all the way around rather than the narrows on the front. So I stuck with the 27s just because I didn't want to change too many things and really put myself in a hurt. So you went on this trail with brand new Terra Masters. Uh, what's your 1500 mile review of those? Uh, considering I have tire left, and I had been considering getting a, a set of big horns. Now the Washington trip, even the, the section that we took here a couple months ago, um, annihilated that brand new set of big horns. And with this set, they're not, they, they're past 50%. They're probably 30, 40%. But the fact that I have tire left after I'm done, I I'll go tackle some trails here in the next couple of weekends with these tires and not have any qualms with them. I'm, I've been really really happy with with the performance that i've seen in out of these tires i know in the bang bro uh mobile over there we were we wanted to drop we need to drop tire pressure going up <laughs> because we had definitely way too much tire pressure and a little too much tire bounce to going around and i was very worried about losing the axle uh because i didn't know the height of our a arms but uh you know we crawled and we were golden up in the orange tangerine <laughs> right but I, I think definitely having like a system where you could air out your tires and air them back up, that would be something uh, useful on this trip. Yeah. And having, having a system to do that um, would mm. be beneficial for anyone doing that kind of a trip. And, you know, Wes and I both had power tanks 
mm-hmm. on our rigs and we were able to, to do powering up uh filling up and and, pow- and emptying out and and doing the air jacks and all that stuff uh because we brought those resources with us and if you are doing these trails that's something to consider if you're going to be you know doing a, an electric compressor or if you're going to be doing an air mm-hmm. tank or, or whatever um kind of judging how often you're going to need to use it how much air pressure you're going to need to do that amp draw amp draw Flex. all that kind of stuff and you know you can't you can't put your car up in the air if your car is not going to start either so no. um that's where air tanks and things like that come in, in in real handy uh bam you have a hard out in about nine minutes right yeah i, sh- I mean i gotta get prepped for this call uh, i also have a hard out i gotta get back to work <laughs> 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 just wanted to you know take take my time to say you know we appreciate everything you've put into doing these two runs and we can't wait till you guys can pump out this content uh where can we find follow all that stuff you guys and what you're going to be doing with this episode uh along with some of the other stuff you're doing yeah i mean uh, as far as uh as far as our personal pages obviously bam bam dot productions is my personal page I always have a bunch of teasers getting posted out from all the work, whether it's this or other work. Um, Brant has his personal page. And then as far as where the actual full length, full length TV shows are going to go, it's called Moto Driven Films. And you can actually find that on Roku. Um, Basically, super simple. If you go on the app, you can go to add channel, search in Moto Driven Films. Um, From there, it'll place a little icon actually on your homepage. And then you can find all the TV shows that we do. Uh, the one that I do is Shreddy Life with Blake Wilkie and everything. Uh, Brant's in charge of Gears, Rocks, and Wrenches. So, I mean, you can pretty much catch all of the stuff that we produce straight through there. Super simple. And then um, also YouTube if uh, Roku's not your thing. So that's just motor driven films and you're good to go. And the, and the actual show that we're going to be putting this content out on is Gear Rocks, and Wrenches, right? Gears, Rocks, and Wrenches is the title. Yes, sir. But yeah, um, we can start shooting for about October is uh, when the first drop. And it's actually going to be uh, going to Map TV as well uh, a couple weeks later down the road. So, I mean, you got plenty of avenues. So whatever's most convenient for you, Map TV is going to obviously take a little bit more a uh, little bit more time to get to just because they, they're requiring a little bit more up front. But Roku and YouTube are your best bets. I mean... Obviously, everyone has a computer, and we'll so we'll share all the content great. and the links and all that stuff on our pages. I'm sure uh, Cameron and all of the other guys will be doing the same thing, mm-hmm. uh, and uh, and I know that uh, Off Road Power Products is going to be putting out more content on this whole trip, uh, so you can follow them there as well. Um, and uh, yeah, uh, you can follow Bam Bam. He's always got good content. He's always down in Cali and Arizona doing stuff that's pretty entertaining. We don't Abisu. call it Cali. Abasu. <laughs> Yeah, Cal- Cal- yeah Cali. Hey, you get a Frisco in Cali, dude. <laughs> yeah, bro. <laughs> yeah, just to wrap up your part, just uh, thanks for what you're doing, and uh, it was a pleasure to work with you on these two trips uh, on behalf of myself and Ian. Um, and uh, look forward to what you're going to put out, and everybody go follow him um, on Instagram and, and uh, YouTube. I just appreciate you guys having me a part of it. I mean, it's a good group of people. I feel like all of us coming together is just like. I mean, you can ask for more than that. And we get epic stuff. So there's no beating that for sure. Later. See Thank you, you again, Ben, for the, for the ride. <laughs> <laughs> Hopefully it wasn't too bad to fix. <laughs> nah, it's already back on trail. So no big deal. Perfect. All right. Later, boys. See you, bud. And uh, Brant, just wanted to say it was a pleasure to have you on the trip, and uh, your personality and, and smile definitely brought a lot to the game. So uh, it was a, <laughs> it was Aww. definitely fun to have another personality there that just complemented so well with everybody else, and it was great, great to get to know you and, and look forward to having you on the trail again. Thank you, yeah, thank you for having me. Thank you guys for uh, just you know, like I said, I got the, the trail kind of late, but you guys brought me in, and it was no big deal. So it was a uh, definitely once in a lifetime trip. I couldn't ask for any more. Idaho was unbelievable. The the group we went with unbelievable. Um, you know, the whole the whole camaraderie of the trip was was amazing. It's something that I look forward to, and the reason why I do what I do is just because that's kind of like how this sport works. It just kind of brings you together through uh, trial and error, and and we all have fun with it. So I look forward. <clears throat> I look forward to the many more trips. And uh, I uh, I've been telling <clears throat> multiple multiple people about the trail. I just I just really feel like it's something you have to even if you're not into this and you're just into like uh, outdoors, I just think the, the trip is not super abusive on the body. You can make the best of it. Um, 
<clears throat> you know, you get to have stand by for the California one. Yeah, you get to, you get to have great food and go into these little towns, and uh, you know, those people are willing to give their shirt off their back to you, and they just want to know about your life and stuff. So it was just a uh, just a dream come true, a trip that <clears throat> kind of changed me and, and made me grow. So I couldn't ask for anything more from the trip. So thank you guys for, uh, cool. for allowing me to go on. Awesome, uh, Brant. Where can we find you online, and what you're working on? Uh, I'm on Instagram. I'm on Instagram under uh, Brant Page underscore Media. I think uh, that's where I post most of my work. Um, so that's that's pretty much where everything's coming from. Uh, every day is something new for me, so I can't I can't promise what was going to be on there. Uh, I have a lot of stuff in the works. Hopefully, that I want to pursue. So that's uh, that's kind of where you should be able to follow me in my my journey. This time, what's your handle on Grinder? Uh, Big Daddy ninety six. <laughs> ninety six. I like it. Brand, it was really fun working with you, man. So hopefully you, more more projects in the in the future for sure, man. Definitely. Yeah, no, I definitely I want to put something together and whether uh <clears throat> you know we come up and we do another run with you guys for two or three days up through Washington or something like that. It's uh, I'm always down to have fun and definitely uh the overlanding thing. I always knew it was there, but I didn't know much about it. So now I'm kinda of a little overland expert over here off of eating cardboard and a little salad <laughs> yeah and, dude we'll get you some zip off pants and, uh, and some jerusalem cruisers and you'll be ready to rock yes yeah, so i need some jerusalem cruisers <laughs> yeah. and, uh, oh nice more. flex on the jerusalem let's cruisers go camp. baby <laughs> <laughs> awesome change your instagram handle to overland af <laughs> overland as fuck to keep moving on guys uh you know, we got into Montana, then that was pretty much all pavement. Uh, I don't remember there being any dirt in Montana. Did anyone else see any dirt? That's yeah, because you guys drove on the pavement. <laughs> <laughs> I trailered. I was <laughs> Idaho. <laughs> I I was able to uh, call in a favor, have a uh, buddy come over and um, grab the X3 and me and uh, bring my um, Talon to uh, a city that we were going to be heading to next. <clears throat> so we made our way up. Uh, we dropped you off in where? Hamilton? Yep. And, Hamilton, uh, I ran up to... Yeah, no, Hamilton was where I was uh, where I was at. I Marooned. Hotel there. And then uh, the rest of us made our way up to uh, near Lolo. Yep. And, uh, Lolo. And uh, Wes, you had some buddies over there that we got to, to hick, hook up with? Yeah, you know, Sean Cummins is a good friend, and he did a... Uh, I don't know that you could have had a better host. That was I mean, pretty epic uh, in my opinion. You know, he told us that we could stay in his yard, which I was elated about, you know, that he had a place big enough for us to all camp in peace and not worry about where we were going. And I, I did not expect everybody to get a bed, everybody to get beer and everybody to get breakfast. You know, that was and showers. pretty, that was a pretty awesome uh, event to have happen, you know, day four or five. His house was beautiful. The place was gorgeous. And we got some real good gouge on a, on a very, very good trail coming out of Lolo into Loxaw Lodge. So that was a pretty, Montana. that was pretty awesome. Um, having that speaks to the community of, of guys that are in this kind of genre of off-roading and, and outdoors and all that stuff. Like, you know, there's very hard, it's a hard time to find people that really just don't fit with other people. Like everybody in this community is pretty w open and to hospitality and, and working with you and helping you fix things and, and all that. And you know, the, the time we had with him at his, uh, at his house, I mean, come on, he had three houses for everybody to spread across and, uh, and, uh, the baller. He, he, he was flexing his, uh, real estate cred a little bit. Um, the fact that we all had showers, when, before we went to bed and, and it was a big morale boost. It was everybody's faces were just a different shape of smile in the morning when we woke up. And so you big shout out to him and what he did for us there. Um, you know, that's a lot of to take to take on that. I mean, you got the cleaning, you got everything afterwards. Once we left, um, it was just a, a, we really appreciated the time that he put his family put into the hosting us and having us out there. Ian's private moment with that uh, with that bike that had the track on it was awkward. I think I can say that. Oh, that uh, bike? Other than that. <laughs> Wait a minute. What happened? <laughs> <laughs> I was going to switch the video to Ian, but I don't think that would have. <laughs> but uh, yeah, I think Ian had a moment with the uh, things in the garages uh, when we showed up. But the uh, biggest, that was the biggest uh, 
what do you call it? The uh, snowmobile I've ever seen. Thing I've been long as the Maverick. So it's snow bike. Yeah, he's, got, he's got a snowmobile and a snow bike. He has a Rev in there, and uh, I think he had what the hell was that, Wes? Was that a that, that was a CR? It was all completely unique to me. I'd never CR seen anything like either of those. Yeah, I think it was a Honda 450 with a snow kit on it, like a Yeti or a timber sled. Yeah. yeah. Oh, that was a KTM. Oh, was it? Yeah. Gotcha. The uh, the timber sled thing. I was talking about that giant snow mach- the snow machine, the snowmobile. Yeah, he had. He also had an RMK or something in there too. Yeah, he's got all the goodies. Yeah, and that wasn't the shop, by the way. That was the other garage. <laughs> like all the good shit was in the shop that we never even went into. Yeah. So uh, in the morning, you cooked. Uh, you helped cook us breakfast, and we had pancakes and and bacon, and that really helped drive some energy into us for that day. Uh, and we got back on trail and and started heading a little bit south, uh, and down to. Um, what was that? Loxaw. Uh, Loxaw. And then, you know, when we stopped for gas, it was interesting because we saw we started seeing the big groups of adventure bikes. Like that campground was just pure bikes, people out on that trail system. It was pretty, pretty crazy. For what it's worth, we we did the the whole BDR route, uh, Mike and I anyway. Uh, there was two parts of it that if you don't do any else or any of the rest of it, do that Florence 643 and do the Elk Meadows. They call it an alternate route, but it absolutely should not have been alternate. That should have been the the route. And then taking the road to Loxaw should have been the alternate. That was the prettiest, biggest, most amplitude of the entire, uh, the entire trip. If you ask me, it was, it was a do not miss trail. And then we made our way up to uh, Pierce, uh, and then we ended up having Ben um, take us on a, on a fun adventure. Uh, what happened up there? Uh, there was a we were on pavement, and then we were all going straight, and then all of a sudden you weren't. Well, let's not forget about the you breaking an axle part in Pierce. Well, we already talked about the axle thing. I learned the big tire small turn problem guys. early on. So, but, but uh, that's how what fast put was us behind these guys as we waited? We, that's true. They were out ahead of us. Uh, well, they, they stayed, but they went out and came back, right? And then... Um, mm-hmm. No, we caught up with them. That's right. Okay. Yeah, we so, caught up through the ground. But how fast was that axle change? We were able to um, bust that out pretty quick. Minutes. Yeah. It, that was probably the fastest axle change I've ever done. Um, but we were all set, ready to go. Like we, You started working on the jack. I started working on the tools and getting the axle out and everything. We banged that thing out pretty fast. Um, and that goes to, you know, who you're traveling with. If you, if you go with a bunch of guys that are relying on you to get everything done, you know, that's a pretty big, um, responsibility, but going with guys that have equal experience or, or even more knowledge than you to jump in, to help, to have the tools that you maybe forgot or didn't bring, um, you can solve problems quickly. And so, yeah, I broke an axle, taking a turn on the, on pavement too hard on bigger tires that my vehicle wasn't used to. It had OEM axles from 2016. They were they were done for the world. So, uh, it snaps sheared off. We replaced the axle and we were back on trail. And, uh, when we caught up with everybody, we went past an intersection. There was a left-hand turn, um, and the trail kept going straight, but we ended up finding, um, somebody in a hole. The third route. Oh, we didn't find somebody in a hole. We saw Ian giving that. I bent my Wookiee look (laughs) while there's a string going into the hole. (laughs) That's true. And, that's what we saw. So what? What? Who? Who found Ben? Well, Ben. It was Ian a- and I and Bam Bam and uh, Brant. So you guys came up on um, a T in the road that had some wheels up in the air. Uh, yeah, I mean Ben. Not not exactly. Wheels weren't up in the air. He he landed it. Props to Ben. <laughs> uh, Stuck to landing. Yeah, but we just <laughs> uh, Ian and I were actually continuing down the road, and all I remember hearing as Brant being like, holy cow, or something on the radio. And um, Ian immediately was like, oh, no. Like, he immediately knew something, you know, went wrong. And Ian flipped to Yui and started making our way back. So I, I can tell you right now, we actually heard the crash through Brant's comms. Really? Hear, oh, yeah. Well, yeah, we could hear the brushes and everything like that, uh, twig snapping and all that stuff. So, Ben, why don't you kind of explain what happened? 
So uh, we took the corner. Ian and I took the corner. I was hard on his heels, keep trying to keep up. And uh, he stopped. And, and since we were kind of having touchy comms, we decided with, with the media crew, and they were behind me, uh, we decided, decided Ian was going to keep going, and I was going to make sure that they made that corner. And uh, I put it in reverse. And if you've been in a YXZ, you know there's absolutely no view out the back. And I made the mistake of – making the decision not to put my passenger side mirror on. And uh, when I was backing up, I was trying to keep an eye out behind me. So if, if they they uh, drove by, I could try to get a hold of them or something with, with what a little I had. And uh, hooked a tire off the ledge and it collapsed. And I went. Tumbling down into some, some greenery. Yeah. Yeah. You know, I, I just decided that since the, since there wasn't any excitement that day, maybe I should do something to kind of bring up. We needed content. That's right. The media guys were complaining <laughs> that there was no excitement. So I was just trying to do my part and an axle change. Wasn't going to do it. That's right. Yeah. You know, after, after West did his boot and axle change was an old hat. So I had to do something to bring the game. If up, you've so. seen one razor axle change, you've seen them all. <laughs> <laughs> I won't so, lie. Yeah, uh, took took a couple of t- rolls over and ended up on my tires and uh, scrambling trying to to get to the top of the the embankment in order for people to catch where I was at so I could get some help getting my car out. And uh, fortunately, the boys saw me saw my tires as I went over and and yeah. And that was a hole big enough and thick enough and greenery that if no one saw you going over. Yeah. I don't think anybody would have even batted an eye wow. at that hole. And no. so being close or having good comms is the only way that that situation would have ever resulted in a good thing. Yeah, um, exactly. Cause we would have been 40 miles past you before we realized, Hey, where's Ben? <laughs> <laughs> it would have been the next stop. Honestly, it would have been the next stop when we all joined together, realizing that the Ben wasn't there because Ben wasn't talking on the comm. So we really didn't have that confirmation the entire time. So, um, that kind of points to that whole thing, like stay close or stay communicating because at any given point, somebody could disappear. (laughs) Yeah. Of course, I'm always surprised that you guys didn't. Zero miles an hour, we might add. Yes, absolutely. I mean, when I pulled up, I thought you ran out of talent going fast into the corner and yarded it down the road. Yeah. But, you know, you were going zero when you rolled. I did. Yeah. Yeah, and yeah. It's, it's not always right in the trail or the corner or the drift or the whatever. It, it can be the little things that get us. Oh, it's at that point in time between the the sleep and the hours and the time spent in it. No, it's the little details that'll get you. Yeah, because at yeah. that time, you've, you've really not had a lot of sleep. You've really not had awesome nutrition unless you've really packed like Wes. Um but uh, those things can start to play with you. And like Wes was saying, sometimes on those trails, you can get a little, you can drift off a little bit and get a little glassy eyed and be um, a little bit un- unattentive. Or completely asleep. Or, <laughs> or not remember a whole section. Um, and so you get really got to understand your body and how you react to this kind of endur- endurance type riding. It's not the same thing as going out for two hours. It's not the same thing as wasting a full tank of gas. It's, mm-hmm. it's a lot different when you're, pushing yourself this far for that long yeah uh, so right right after ben uh made his little jaunt down the ravine um ian and i immediately um, um i believe brant and bam bam like obviously yelled down the hill like hey are you okay um i think um you know there's a lot of adrenaline going we got the that he was you know, okay, good to go. And then we immediately started trying to run. Then we left him. Oh, winch line down the hill. Um, we went back for dinner. that guy. Marked his position and kept on just yeah. down a few miles. No, we uh, hooked one winch up to him and uh, just kind of realized that that wasn't enough. At that time, um, Wes and the rest of the crew showed up. Um, I kind of passed off the winching portion to Wes and you know as much as i gave him a hard time about having a dishwasher and a massage table um what's one thing wes is very dialed as far as the gear that he brings and he immediately had every recovery widget that you could ever need (laughs) um and that's johnson valley talking is what it is exactly you know he was you know we were dialed um stopping traffic to make sure no winch lines are going to get run over and we were able to get him out so it worked out sweet 
at, at that point, we nobody had eyes on Ben. You know, we were just trying to troubleshoot and get the car out, get connected to the car. And the car was on its way out, but nobody had actually gotten eyes on. And Wes, when Wes pulled up, because mind you, when Wes is approaching, he hears everything that's going on because he, he can hear everything through the radio, can hear us relaying traffic. They actually jumped a channel so that they could talk as they were approaching. But when Wes pulled up, he gets out of the car and he looked at me and goes, where do you need me? And I said, I think we need to get eyes on him because I, I hadn't even talked to him. From that point, Wes gets in the hole, and it was just, it was, it was just, you know, we got him out, got him looked at, got him checked out. I mean, Wes probably hasn't talked about it on the podcast, but uh, you got a little bit of a background when it comes to first aid recovery, the whole ball of wax. Bunch of history with it. You know, uh, the military does a pretty good job teaching you about uh, triage and emergency medical. I was, you know, a firefighter before I joined the Navy anyway. And uh, recovery is a huge part of uh, rock crawling. You know, it's not like an exception to what you're doing. It's the whole thing. You know, in order to do the trail, you're essentially doing recovery activities. And then when you, uh, you add mobility for the military and a handful of other things, it really is kind of my strong spot. But uh, I've seen enough injuries off road that I bring a good, you know, a full med kit and, uh, and a full recovery kit. And that's the stuff that makes the trip before the stakes, you know, uh, like Cam said, you know, you got the Shiatsu massage table, which I might add as a joke. I didn't actually have a Shiatsu massage table, but, uh, but those are the priorities. Those are your first line things that have to make the trips. Recovery gear, first aid gear, uh, comms, uh, spare parts. Then you start adding sleeping bags. Then you start adding ground pads. And I want to say that this has a lot to do with <clears throat> our, our ability to arrive on the situation and take care of the situation was based off experience. If you're not out winching and if you're not out setting up your equipment and using it for the way that it was meant to be used, you're not going to have that instant response capability. You're going to have to sit there and figure things out the hard way. And, and it, it speaks huge to putting the time in before you do something big to learn how to do it appropriately. Just like, you know, in the seals you guys were practicing every day. And like you say, pr practice as perfect as you can to make sure that when you're in need, you can actually get things done and not waste time. And with a situation like Ben being down the hole, you know, he could have had a broken femur. He could have had a broken whatever. He could have had a branch through his, you know, through his side. And being able to address those situations is a huge part of adventure riding. And if you don't know any basic medical, if you don't know how to winch out, if you don't know, you know, where to hook onto a car without destroying it halfway up the hill, you know, that kind of stuff all comes into play and, and definitely something to take into consideration if you're thinking about multi-day adventure riding type remote. scenarios. No, it's it's and definitely remote. basics for if you're if you want to go and visit these remote locations, you need to be self-contained. You got to know how to handle that. Handle those At situations. that particular yeah. spot, we had paper maps out. Yeah. Because we had the trail and the surrounding, you know, small area as actually mapped out. But Ian's got the Butler map out. We've got a handful of other resources that we were looking at to find what the nearest town was, what the nearest campground was. Mm. You know, Possible we ended up hospital. camping at a wide spot in the road that we found because we didn't have the offline data. Uh, we, we weren't rich in offline data in that area. Right. And it was another real strong point for the inReach satcoms. Mm. That's what I was going to bring you up know, was that inReach was invaluable. A Just, couple times over. You know, Cam was, had one. Yeah. Ian's got one now. I had one. We were able to split the party or call for a medical or call for life flight. We were able to definitely make comms with Ben's wife and uh, get trucks rolling that direction to where we could feel confident. Uh, that he was going to be recovered early the next day and start moving. Without the SATCOMs, I, I don't know what we're doing. We're leaving a car by the side of the road and going back to Pierce. We, we would have relayed stuff from the incident site back to Wi-Fi and Pierce, and that would have been a process. Yeah, that would have taken a whole day just on its own. We would have been towing back to town and doing other things versus getting back on trail. Plus, it was also the closest we'd ever been to a town. 
Okay. You give it another 20 minutes, same problem. You're now, you know, 15 miles. You're giving it another 20 minutes. You know, there was a bunch of times where we were 70 miles from the nearest thing. So I guess what I took out of that is Ben does this a lot and uh, you guys get to practice <laughs> recovery with him. So. <laughs> Thanks. Thanks, Ben, yeah, for keeping everyone the uh, sharp. <laughs> I also I'm, highly recommend not bringing John Cena. That, yeah. that to be a, like, no, leave him. Leave him at home. The guy is very alpha, for sure. <laughs> yeah, that's that. That was the point where Mike had the best one-liner of the entire trip. Oh, it's so good. Yeah. Out of nowhere, we were unexpected. Coop. Coop would have pulled that out minute one, <laughs> but this was minute thirty. Yeah. <laughs> he had to. Mike's Mike's patient. You know, he had to let it marinate a little bit. It was so good, and so, we needed it. We needed that break. And so for clarity, for everyone listening, we had gone through the extraction of the car. We have gone through getting settled down, getting people communicating, figuring out Medical game plans. Medical evaluation. And, and Wes had jumped in with his med kit, got Ben sit down, making sure concussions weren't a big problem, making sure that the cuts on his arm were dealt with, with the appropriate uh, tools. Um, you know, we had been gotten through all the high stress part of this and we're starting to wind down a little Found bit his stuff because he <laughs> yard sales all of his shit inside the bushes <laughs> and and so uh everything was recovered and and it was at that point where like the stress was there but it was ready to fall off it just needed something to break the camel's back and here comes mike perfect timing perfect etiquette and in delivery just nailed it <laughs> <laughs> Fucking John Cena. <laughs> so something something else that I'd like to add to the discussion about safety is is we're in Pierce and I remember making the conscious decision to put my my harness on. You know, I was thinking, okay, we're getting towards the end of the day. Do I need to really wear it? Uh oh yeah, just to be I probably shouldn't. I put my harness on and cinched it down. And to be completely honest, if I hadn't, I'm I have every confidence that you guys would have been calling a life flight because I'd have been dead. Well, that's that. That brings up a big one with me because I mean, as as reckless and as goofy as as I may be out there, it's it's all because of the quality gear that we use, and and it it takes me back to a time when Cameron was hopping in with me in a Terex four to go rip real quick, and he goes, "I probably don't need to put this on," and I said, "Well, they put those things in here for a reason. If you have it, <laughs> use it because you don't want to be that person that's like, well, gosh, I had this really nice, fancy." super state-of-the-art 4.5 point whatever point harness and i still injured myself because i didn't use it take the extra steps i get it there, there's a hassle there with and we joked about it at, at, on this you know it's okay let me take my 30 minutes to go get in my rig and get all <laughs> rigged up, up but let's also not forget that the most serious incident of the trip happened at zero miles an hour Right, true. <laughs> yeah. And the harness still was a key part of keeping him safe. Totally. Even at it zero miles an hour. Was. Yep. Talking about yard sailing all my stuff, that would have been me if I hadn't hard, had my harness on. And you made a comment about him yard sailing in the bushes to give the audience perspective. Basically, if you can visualize the real tree camera <laughs> pattern, <laughs> you yard it in where basically a ditch that probably a, a guy could have just disappeared into <laughs> It, it was all up in there. Yeah. Yeah. And I think that the thing, one of the things that was really beneficial was at the bottom, I think, Ben, you were saying that it's just covered in logs at the bottom. It really looked like uh, the logging industry. Every time they went around the corner, they just dropped a couple of logs in there. And so you have probably 40 or 50 logs in there. I was high centered. I was, I was, as I was sitting there doing my assessment to make sure that I wasn't dead, I made, I was kind of looking at, it, okay, can I go forward or backwards? What kind of motion can I make? And and I was absolutely high centered. I was another ten or twelve inches off the ground. And if and if they weren't there, how much deeper would you have gone down that that hole and and potentially you know been you know punctured by a tree or you know arm went out the window because you couldn't hold on any longer you know whatever the case may have been. So. Yeah. You know, part of off-roading is skill. Part of it is your equipment and maintenance of that equipment. And then there is a small, a very important part of that, which is luck. 
um, that you don't come around a corner and get skewered by a, a, a fallen tree or, or something. So um, definitely grateful that you are here today talking without any stitches in your face. Absolutely. And, uh, you know, that any was more stitches. I got enough. <laughs> I don't need any more. But uh, so we 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 got you out. We got you recovered. We started figuring out logistics of getting your wife to come pick you up with the truck and trailer because she was already up to north, going heading to North Idaho to stage to pick us up at the end of the trail. So it was just a minor adjustment to that situation. Again, the inreach coming in critical there. Um, and uh, then we camped overnight on the side of the road. Got you back to Pierce, or did she pick you up at Pierce, or did she pick you up at the campsite there? Um, she picked me up in Pierce. And then we picked my car up at the campsite. Gotcha. And we had parked it up, uh, up the hill on next to a gate, um, out of the way, if I remember right. Yeah. I, I completely let my car down. That was one of the most angry things. Most re the biggest reasons I was so angry is because that car did everything it could to get me to the end. And I completely baked it. You know, I lost my temper as we were trying to get me out of the out of the hole i put it in reverse i knew better and and i still did it and i ended up frying the clutches and obviously that put me out of the ride and uh, it was all me it was it was all my my temper and and my impatience and uh, if i hadn't if i had to done that i have every belief that i would be i would have been sitting at that that ending with you guys yeah, it was a real bummer to get all the way to that point and then have you have to drop out like that. And I know, Coop, you went through that same feeling, um, not being able to hit that middle section. Yeah, which I know it doesn't sound like it missed a whole lot. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, as far as ground cover, I mean, I missed a lot as far as that. Once I finally got Thanks, Cooper. connection Thanks. with you, I was like, dang, yeah, we, we lost someone. What the what in the hell? <laughs> No, I meant ground. I'll tell you what, that was <laughs> <laughs> Although that's that's good, I, I'll I'll take it. <laughs> I, I, did, I, I did make the joke that when Cooper's car uh, when Cooper's car went out, I, I, I we were in Darby. I was telling him, I go, literally, guys, the only adult presence on this entire team just left. <laughs> 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 Proof that we cannot be left alone to our own devices. <laughs> yeah. No one, anyone that knows me won't believe that. <laughs> yes. I'll tell you what, though, going from Pierce into Avery, awesome. Avery and the Wallace was God's country. That was some really, really fun, beautiful scenery. You know, we got to do that during the day, which was nice. So uh, we made our way up. Uh, we had originally planned on landing in... Um, Clark Fork. Clark Fork, right. Yeah, Clark Fork uh, at, at a house up there, and we ended up not really getting there that night. We uh, ended up... Different during... night. Oh, no. Th this was the day after the day after Ben. That was that was kind of a big day, though. because We then, stayed in Pierce, yeah. but then we ended in Wallace. Yep. You ended in Wallace. I, ended I, in Wallace. I came down and met you guys. I think I was just... I don't... How far past where uh, Ben's incident was? Was, oh, was we awesome. ran into it you basically at the blue yeah. cabin. Yeah, that's where we ran into you at the, at the blue house um, cabin at the top of the hill. Yeah, just uh, I that was probably sixty miles it. from Ben's deal. Met you guys. And where did you drop in at? Where did you guys? Wallace. Where, you you dropped out at Wallace, <sighs> and then met us down uh, at the blue cabin. Um, I kept going for a long time. Yeah. after you guys. I guarantee you, in actual trail miles, Cooper joined us forty miles after Pierce uh, after the incident site. Right. Whereas, it was about he halfway. Yeah, because he kept going. He was, south. he was further south than the Blue Cabin. We probably rode 40 minutes to an hour before we came back to the Blue Cabin. Yeah. I know. We, we were out ahead of you guys. Yeah. Uh, we still had you on comms, but uh, but we were we, we were ahead of you because you left Pierce at about the same time that we left uh, the roadside, and uh, we did him out. Yeah, so we all made the decision to start moving forward at that point, yeah. and we would catch up with each other. We just wanted to make sure we were covering ground, getting the uh, catching up from all the 
the delays that we had, we wanted to make sure we were going to try to make this goal of, of hitting the, the, Wallace. the border and, and Wallace on the way. So, um, so that was kind of our goal was to, uh, I was with, uh, Wes and, and Mike and we, we went up to made our way up to Wallace after hitting blue cabin. And how about that riding, you know, going in and out of the, the pines there, that's where it really started getting thick oh, in the yeah. pines and really started getting shadowy Avery and, and the cave. going the into tunnel. Avery was tunnels. like somebody had unpaved a race course. That's definitely the, the biggest area that I recommend guys. If you're going to Idaho and you want to do some riding like, and see some good variation like that you're right off the freeway the pulaski highway from uh wallace to avery is pretty rad yeah and avery Insane. has turned into quite the hot spot for off-roaders mm-hmm. um and to a point where we set we we stopped and had pizza you guys stopped oh, yeah. and had chicken um like we got some crappy gas we just had a great time and uh <laughs> they have an ice cream shop there it's an actually great stop to go if you if oh, you're with the family and you want to go out on trails and then hit a nice kind of like turnaround spot and relax and go in the river and you know all that stuff avery is mm-hmm. just the place to be so um we all kind of hit that spot at different points and then we all met up at wallace or just north of wall yeah, it was wallace yeah and then we hit the campsite um and then wes what uh what ha- went, went down with your car well, that was the hardest 26 miles of the trip for Mike and I, you know, we, uh, we got fueled up on, you know, wood fired pizza and, uh, and a couple nice beers fueled up in Avery. And then before we made the turn to get onto that, uh, double track where you can either go high or low before that turn, we started throwing codes at the same second, Mike and I threw codes at the same exact second and then it would pu- 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 for the next 26 miles, like where you can't get a gas, you can't go fast. I had a 5,800, 6,000 RPM limit. So going out of Avery was pretty nightmarish to get to Wallace. And it was real clear we were done training at that minute. Like we got to pull this thing apart. And, uh, you know, Coop's got a thick Rolodex in that area. <laughs> and uh, we were able to find somebody to offload my fuel to. Um, I don't know why mine had worse problems than Mike's. Mike's is bone stock. Mine's pretty close to stock. I've got a, like a sub level one dyno jet, you know, warm up tune, uh, and an exhaust, but that's it. So, and, uh, I think the difference was I had another 2000 miles on my car than Mike did. So if I'm in, if I'm in my truck or my side-by-side or something like that, and I see a fuel truck at a fuel station dumping fuel, I don't, I go on to the next fuel station. Cause all that's doing is just, it's agitating. It's getting up all that sediment that's at the bottom of the tank. And that's about to go into your tank. I kind of wonder if maybe something like that happened. Maybe, maybe we, you guys have missed a fuel truck by about 20 minutes to an hour or something like that. And maybe you got that first batch of gas out of it. It was just garbage. Zach got the same gas. Yeah, you know, and we didn't have a fuel pressure issue. We had a fouling issue. But when we, I pulled my plugs, they didn't look as horrible as I thought they would. But draining the fuel did it. We got rid of five gallons of the of the, I'd say eight that I had left, and then I topped it off with ninety one non F at a uh, in Wallace, and the car ran acceptably for the rest of the trip. It it still wouldn't pull past eight grand, and you know I <laughs> I came home and I bought spark plugs and a spare set of spark plugs because turns out those are rare as frog hair. You're not going to find those in every auto parts store. Yeah. I was surprised to find out that your, your spark plugs were so unique. On oh, the and you pull them apart and you realize why they're super goofy looking. Yeah. You know, they've got a thread section. that's you know, probably an inch and a half long. Right. And there are these little tiny things. And it turns out that I'd never changed the spark plugs on that car. Cause I'd never had to. And it's a bit of an evolution. Uh, not only do you need some weird tools, like I don't own a 14 millimeter spark plug socket until, you know, this week. And you have to have a little tiny extension and get in there. And it, it's a, it's another whole set of tools that are now going to come with me, but I didn't think I needed. And, uh, and when we cleaned out the spark plugs, dropped the fuel, got new fuel in. One of the guys that uh, was at the campground in Wallace gave us some sea foam. And that might have been equally to blame for it uh, recovering. 
but shout out to Coop's buddy who uh, gave me the gap tool and the, uh, and the ability to offload some fuel. Garrett but, uh, dude, thanks homie. And he, he own does he own a store down there in Wallace? He, uh, works at, um, um, oh gosh, mining fab. It's gotcha. Uh, it's his, uh, his get up, but, uh, he does a lot of off-road racing and stuff like that. We rock stuff, buggies, things of that nature. But so he was pretty in, in line with what needed to happen and, and was ready to help. Yeah, yeah. No, he is uh, he is a, always awesome. He'll he'll drop whatever he's doing. As a matter of fact, I kind of felt bad because he was in the middle of dinner with his girlfriend. When he, <laughs> he said he'd meet me at his shop, and I was like, "Oh man, sorry." But, uh, also, shout out to the sheriffs in Wallace who waved at me as I'm driving by with a five-gallon <laughs> bucket outside of my car and just, <laughs> hi, folks. That's Idaho. Yeah. Nothing to see here, just a five-gallon bucket full of fuel. Wow. So then uh, you guys uh, spent spent the night there, mm-hmm. and then we headed up north. Ooh-wee. <laughs> yeah that was uh that was a night that was a night that was a uh, or a day whatever yeah. whatever just, it was. just so you know like when we left wallace i you know i i made sure the entire trip not to say that we were claiming it not to say that we were on the home stretch not to say that things were going good mm-hmm. i felt good leaving wallace like i was like we're on the back stretch we're looking pretty good and then immediately we come in to run off and come into mud we come into tree hangers those ones that'll impale you like mm-hmm. a joust Admitting, Here's Mike and I. And, and, yeah, are idiots. yeah, and and my first thought was, okay, so Idaho wants the last word. <laughs> so, yeah, we uh, we started hitting the hills, and then the sun started going down pretty quick, mm-hmm. and uh, the the Razor 1000 that the filmers were in decided to um, throw another belt, yep. and that was the fourth one of the trip so mm-hmm. far. I don't know. I think we had that gotten was- too early on, and that yeah. was the what was that? That was the second belt? Yeah. yeah we, we lost one in Nevada and then lost one in Wallace. Yep. Yep. And uh, and so then we were out in the middle of nowhere, uh, 20 miles north of Wallace, 40 miles south of where we were trying to get to. And uh, I think it was more than 40. Oh, it was, it was it 60? I think it was like... I think it was 80 total, like 80-ish. It was a mess load. Yeah. We and... Were, uh, we making any any ground on that one. No, we we, we got stuck and uh, we're just outside a cell phone range. Well, I had cell phone range uh, for a little bit, and then we started towing out. Uh, Coop had his talon at this point, so it was the best car to pull. Uh, he pulled the tow strap out and and was pulling the one thousand. Um, and uh, at that pace, we were going, I think, an average of five miles an hour, eight something like that. Yeah, and uh, we weren't going to go anywhere fast at that momentum, so. Uh, and, and then Coop, then Coop pulled the greatest trail audible I've ever seen in my life. <laughs> I just had an epiphany there in the in the yeah. in the fog that a buddy of mine was at his camp not that far away, and he happened to have a Razor One Thousand of the same year. And thank God for the uh, Garmin inrange, I was able to text him. He was up still, and I uh, we ended up pulling down to the highway there, and. I burned back about 10 or so miles. Got to see my boy who was out camping with his son, uh, um, with my buddy Jamie's son at their uh, campground and uh, grabbed the belt. And the funny thing is, and this will come into play when we get to Canada, is uh, my buddy Jamie goes, well, I happen to have two belts here for that. (laughs) If you want to take them both. And I was like, yeah, you know what? I will. I'll take both of those. (laughs) And, uh, Ran back and you guys all got a nice little trail nap in. Yep. And then we uh, carried on. Carried like on. Nothing happened. You guys got after it pretty early that next morning too. Yeah. Well, you know where we. For what it's worth, though, like leading up to that event when we were coming into Avery, and then what happened with the belt on trail there, when we were waiting for production to set up at the end of these tunnels because Avery from Avery to Wallace has a lot of tunnels. So we were, we were getting set up for shots in there. I was falling asleep in my car. And then when Coop disappeared to go get his, his spare belt, I fell asleep in my car, like literally just leaning my head against my door and I'm out. 
So I mean, see, sleep was at a premium at this run for this run. I mean, I think I figured between the, the seven days from Jarbage to the home to home was, I, I don't think I got 24 hours worth of sleep that entire seven day window. So it was a, uh, it, it, it had been a, it had been a rough seven days up into that point, but yeah, I couldn't believe that we lucked out that much. Yeah. So we, uh, we decided to then hit the trail hard early, uh, and made our way up into Clark Fork. Epic um, breakfast. Oh, <laughs> just an epic <laughs> breakfast in we, Clark Fork. We I have, don't want to talk about it next. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> we have this thing with breakfast and stopping for some reason. Uh, we waited. Oh, it was an hour. Plus. An hour plus after the lady took our, our order and uh, got nothing in return. Yeah. Uh, to the point where they hadn't even started the meal uh, when we checked. Started cooking at an hour plus in. Yeah, and there wasn't like they were they were slammed. <laughs> no, we there was like it. four people there. That's okay. Good for them. I don't remember the name of the place. Uh, we it's ended up going. Best. <laughs> it's probably best. We ended up going across the street to the gas station and grabbing mm-hmm. um, an epic gas station meal um, for yeah. those of us that were risking it, and uh, decided to move on. No, we carried on and uh, made our way up north. We started heading up past uh, Lake Ponderay. Mm-hmm. And, um, you know, some pretty awesome views to be had up there. Uh, if you don't know Lake Ponderé, uh, pretty much every angle on that place is, uh, pretty, pretty beautiful. So, um, and then, uh, we started making our way up North towards the border and this was day, uh, eight, right? 75. Day 75 of day 75 of of five five day trip. And, uh, (laughs) we, uh, were able to, uh, it was interesting. Once you got past Lake Ponderay, you, you were stuck in this kind of Valley and it just opened up into a bunch of farmland in between two mountain ranges that just stopped dead center into the farmland. Yep. It just drops straight into the fields. And, uh, you really glossed past Clark Fork too. that, (laughs) God, the view coming into Clark Fork is pretty insane. Oh, yeah. I mean, what a beautiful area that is. Yep. Yeah, you were like in the airfield. I remember you called that out on the radio. That was pretty cool. Yeah, so there's there's tons of awesome uh, views to be had. Basically, from Avery North, you just can't stop getting awesome views, in my opinion. Um, and so, uh, uh, end of the, end of the, of the journey here, we make our way up to the border. We pull in and, um, I was expecting there to be more than there was, but it was basically a gas station, a souvenir shop and the border station. Yep. All closed. All closed. <laughs> All closed. Um, which was a bummer. Uh, but, uh, there was, there's a lake up there that you can go swimming in, boating in and all that, but there's basically nothing there. And, uh, also we kept talking like it was Bonner's Ferry, but it wasn't. Uh-uh. Uh, it was way Bonner's north. Ferry is 20 miles south of there. Yeah. That and was called uh, something point or whatever. Point. Port Head. Port Hill. Port Hill. Port Hill. Yeah. Oh, the border. I'm sorry. Yeah. 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 So Port Hill, uh, border crossing up into Canada. Mm-hmm. Uh, and so we arrived there. We we went through some awesome uh, fields and stuff. We, we arrived there and then it was kind of climatic but also anticlimactic because like you were there. There was nothing really visually like. But you didn't want to be done. But you got there, and then you realized, oh, th- we we stopped, <laughs> like not stop for a break, but like this is the end of that journey that we just started. That feels like it was a, a really long journey, but it also felt like we just started. Like there was still a lot more to do. Yeah, yeah, yeah I weird. had fifteen hundred more miles to do. <laughs> it, it's weird when you kind of get in the rhythm with these trips, and it's kind of like okay, just like take it a day at a time. We can make it till the end, and then it's over, and you're like, oh man. <laughs> It was funny, wasn't it, uh, Brian? Uh, like he was that day was kind of just like over it and like was getting kind of grumpy about it, and and then and all I don't of a sudden about grumpy, he was just like, I think with the time constraints that he had and everything else weighing on him, he um, was kind of moved on to the next, right? Like he he had three days worth of stuff ahead of him still that he was thinking of, and gotcha, and so. About. We, we arrived there, we parked there, and then the first thing that I noticed was just everybody got out and was like, there was a moment of silence that seemed to happen whenever we got out of the car, and then all of a sudden, everyone was just like, oh my God, we just did it. Like, <laughs> high fives, hugs, like, yeah, you know, it seemed like the, the, the journey had actually shown uh, itself to us at that point, and, and the relief and the, the satisfaction all came out all at once, and everybody was just super stoked. Yeah, it was pretty but cool. then... As with all things, 
there's still quite a bit of journey left. Yeah. Okay. We, you know, you have broken cars there. You had logistical dramas about picking this up. One car has got to go here. We're by no means done. No, we're just at the end of that route. And there's a lot to be said for, you know, like Ian says, claiming, you know, saying that we did it, claiming the, claiming the trip. Yeah, we did it from garbage all the way to Canada. But then there's, okay, but what did we do? And everything past Clark Fork, in my opinion, was, huh, it was okay. You know, it was, it was a fine day out. There's a lot of people on that road that one. Uh, they're all huckleberry sec- picking. Yeah. Yeah. There, but there was that one section that was just basically a dirt freeway. Right. Um, with a lot of people on it and a lot of people camping and some residential stuff. I would say that it was a yawn or past Clark Fork. In fact, that turn from Clark Fork onto a very, very, very developed off-road route. Uh, What was the name of that trail, Ian? Lightning Creek. Is that what it's called? Because it seemed like that's what everybody in Northern Idaho went to go spend a week. Yeah. So from that turn, north, you can have. And then all the way up to Pine, with exception of uh, the Anderson Reservoir, which was basically Pine, you can also have. Right. If I was to go do this again, I would do it either from Glens Ferry to make it easy to park the truck, because hauling our trailers to garbage kind of blew. Right. You know, the trailers are doing three miles an hour down that road, and they got trashed. Um, that's like the first step. But if we went from Pine to Clark Fork, that's the 95% of that trail. Yep. Yeah. There were some, there were some good views north of Clark Fork, but the riding was, was nothing. You may views, as well, but you could have done it in a Civic. Yeah. I was going to say you could, you, you'd have been better off in a Subaru. I, I think the two considerations that you need to have with the statement of you can have it is the fact that you've just spent five days on some of the best views and scenery that the Pacific Northwest has to offer. Plus you're on day six, seven, eight of what should have been five days exhaustion. I, there, there's plenty of views up there. I think it's just got to be taken in context. If oh, you no, look at it like a song, you've already had you know sensory overload at that point in time. Yeah. Well, and, you know, like on a song, which I'm, you know, familiar with as a musician, you get, you get this intro where things are starting to ramp up and then you start getting more and more and more and more and more in a crescendo. And that crescendo was Wallace, you know, Wallace into Clark Fork was some of the most beautiful stuff of the trip. And then it's like, there's a two minute outro. Right. (laughs) People singing the same thing over and over again. It's nowhere near as interesting. So, I know what you're saying about you would duck that particular section at the end, but after everything that we'd been through where the trail took its toll on our machine, took a toll on our bodies, took one of us out, that easy day was really welcome in my mind. Like when we were yeah, just and not doing it would have even been, you know, I would have loved to have partied with you in Clark Fork. Yeah. When we were I'm just, just saying, the, if you don't have a reason if you don't have this claim that you have to do where I have to go from, uh, from Nevada to Canada, you could have breakfast. I would say that you're going to get a massive uh, benefit for the Idaho BDR. If you either start in Glens Ferry or Pine and stop in Clark Fork and they're both off freeways. And there's plenty of other areas that you can explore up there, you know, Priest Lake, North oh, of Priest boy. Lake, like that there's... whole section to the East of uh, Lake Ponderé there. Yeah. Like Gold Creek, everything else. Like there is a ton of trails in there. Something that I really kind of took home about the BDR trail is, uh, it's 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 nice because it's an established system that you can then follow and and say that you've done it. And that was one of the big goals that we did was we wanted to do the claim of border border get the get the sticker get have that claim. But if you're not out to do that, if that's not your goal, understand that the BDR trails that you can download and go off of mm. are just pointers 
for you to go. And yeah. and there are so many more epic ways you can take that route. And there's certain areas I would I would suggest that everyone take this in chunks mm. because there's so much more to explore on the offshoots that would take you to even more epic views and even more interesting stories right. um, that you would never do if you were just sticking to the BDR. The thing you remember about the I BDR... I thought they did a great job planning it, though. Oh, they did a I mean, I think that it's an extremely totally. well laid out route. And I think they got it right. It's it's a lot different than Washington, though. In Washington, you're jumping in and off, uh, back and forth off these trails like you wouldn't believe. Like, I think I could probably guide a group through Washington, maybe somewhere to the tune of about maybe 15 to 20 percent of Washington where I wouldn't even need a GPS to reference. Idaho's more like 50 to 60 percent. I could probably guide 60 to 70 percent of that route without a GPS right now, especially after last week. Uh, go taking that group through it. And uh, uh, Washington is just not like that. I mean, you are busted. If you don't have comms in Washington, you leave the people home who don't, you know, there's just yeah. too many deviations. Which I do anyway. So uh, yeah, it was, it was pretty awesome to, to uh, officially claim that, but uh, you know, Wes, you had another, uh, you were getting picked up, but then you had to travel basically across the United States to get home. Uh, yeah. Ian and I uh, basically well, had by to... By the way, getting picked up is I paid a guy to drive my truck from Jarbage, Nevada to Canada, right. which took him two days. Right. And and that's the important thing to remember. Like You can't go epic adventures without a support team, mm -hmm. and you have to have those you can rely on and those that you can then uh, have support you because there's no way for you to conquer with, with a UTV, right? Mm -hmm. Like a UTV scenario, you're not going to conquer these scales of trips, uh, without a support system. And so each one of us had our own unique logistical challenges to overcome, to even make it happen to start, let alone finish and then get back home. Yeah. Um, and so each one of us had different stories on how that played out. Um, and you know, when it comes down to, uh, to Wes and his crew and Mike and all that, basically they had to bring people and trucks across the country to make it happen. Uh, you know, Cooper had to rely on people to come help him and pick him up and bring him back home and then get back out again at a different spot that was totally unplanned right. with a different car and a different situation. Well, I feel like I just won the whole event. I'm I'll take the podium there because I got to use more than one UTV. You guys only <laughs> used one. Lame. <laughs> Winning. You know, yeah. The other thing about that, though, is that the uh, there's a lot of things that you can do that maybe we can look back in retrospect and say 1,500 miles in a UTV is 500 miles past its, like, uh, Service line. Service <laughs> right. Okay. You know, there's, there's value to saying you did it. There's also greater value possibly in doing those things as lollipops or loops, you know, as segments of loops where you plan it. Uh, you know, if we were to plan this as side by side trails, you take each one of those days and you do out, stay, come back on different trails. Mm -hmm. I think it's a better move for side by sides because you have to trailer there because you can't, uh, f you know, freeway hop and a handful of other things that you can do on an adventure bike. I think that just because of the genre, I think that they should consider, maybe we should consider developing different styles of, uh, of BDRs for side by sides where you can do one segment, two segment, three segment, four segment. And if you do plan on making it the one stem to stern claim that it's all of the outs. Yeah. They just connect. Together. Yeah. Well, it's if a you guys were to day trip. or we do it down and back. If you guys were to look at my screen right now, I have Safari opened up with the four of you. And then I have Chrome opened up directly to the right. And I'm literally looking at the Oregon BDR right now and trying to figure out how I'm going to make it work for my side by side. So yeah, and I did the same thing with the California, which is that if you look at the California BDR, you can't do it on a non-plated vehicle. Even and a plated so, vehicle is sketchy, isn't it? What's that? Even on a plated, it's sketchy. You got to even on a plated, it's not legal. Yeah. So uh, you know, mine's plated in Arizona, but I'd be pulled over in two seconds in Death Valley National Park. So, uh, pull up Utah. So I'm sitting here going through uh, the California Trail map. You know, shout out to them, and through Lead Nav, trying to re 
do the map so it connects in the main spots. I mean, for example, there's a 30 mile stretch where you're on the 15, <laughs> you know, to go into print. That's a complete non starter. So, fortunately, I've got a bunch of routes in uh, Nevada from doing the mint and for doing a lot of wheeling out there where instead of going out to the freeway, we're going to turn right across the border into Nevada. And, uh, and then go up and around and end up in Prim through a big part of the Mint Loop. And then we can't leave by going south on the 15 into Furnace Creek. We've got to go through Dumont Dunes and, uh, and a bunch of other stuff. So, you know, mission planning is a big part of this. And I'm going to have to chunk that into, uh, into two and three day loops to pre-run it to make sure that we can do it. So this is, uh, a super long episode. I want to kind of just wrap up a little bit. Um, each one of us has kind of gotten big takeaways on how we do our cars, how we load out, like how we approach big trips, um, you know, all this kind of stuff, whether it be the tech we take with us, the equipment. Um, just uh, real quick to kind of wrap up, I want to go through each one of you and just kind of get your perspective on what you're, what's different from when you entered this trip and how you exited that trip and where your perspective has changed a little bit. Um, Cooper, if you want to start off on that. Oh, sure. Um, really good gear is at the high uh, end of, of my list of things, and uh, less is more. <laughs> Once I realized there were only a few things that I was grabbing out of, out of my uh, gear stash and where it was located and the ease of doing everything, I would probably repack my rig quite a bit differently. And... Uh, Good quality tuning. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, a solid car, getting it out and testing it hard. Everything else, perfect, flawless. But uh, I had just uh, finished that build not that long gotcha. um, prior and uh, not enough miles on it for that tuning to really show itself, and uh, at least not hard, hard miles. And, uh, well, it is what it is. You learn something new every day. And going prepared and having a backup plan and all that came in clutch. Yep, totally. And and really, um, the contrast between a belted rig like the Can-Am and then the transmission, uh, manual transmission rig like the Talon was pretty, it was a pretty fun little contrast. And I think they both have their place. But Would you have done that trail on the Talon? Oh, it would have been awesome. That thing was a little workhorse. It was a lot of fun. Yeah. Cooper, I, th I think with some mi minor modifications, the Talon would be a great machine for this type of activity. Totally. No belts to worry about. And, um, you know, it... Uh, and it's so low powered. You don't have any problems breaking stuff. Right. Exactly. <laughs> That's, that is 100% right. But, you know, the funny thing is the power thing is, is just different. And I think it's just because on a belted rig, there's the amount of parasitic losses is big. Whereas, you know, I don't know what the equivalent horsepower would be for power to the ground as that Honda, but like there's no, it's, it's directly coupled to the ground. So that smaller horsepower number, it kind of fibs you. Right. Cause it, it still scoots. And, and, it, and you think about your average miles per hour, like you don't need a monster right. to do this. No, not for this. Yeah. It just needs to be comfortable. It needs to be able to corner. I, I will say, I really like the seating position in the Can Am because you just kind of <laughs> you're in a, a lounge chair, you know. You're yeah. a lazy boy, and it's super comfy, especially for me. So, Cam, what was uh, what can you take away from this uh, Idaho BDR trip that we took, and kind of how that looked compared to how you went into it? Um, I definitely think going into it, just understanding the amount of miles and being a camera operator on the trip, you know, making sure. Um, I'm taking care of myself and taking care of myself. One of those things is I like having a nice sleeping system. Um, <laughs> so yeah, I slept, slept good every night. I had a good, good tent, good pad, um, and just getting good sleep and, um, yeah, just taking the time, take care of yourself and you'll be able to put in the miles for sure. Awesome. Uh, Wes, what was kind of your takeaway? I've been doing overland on a side by side for a long time. Uh, the first one I did was in 2007 uh, in a Rhino. There was a really heavily modified Rhino turned into a four seat, but you know, it was my wife and I. And starting then we realized pretty quickly that if you think of it as mounted backpacking, you'll be a lot better off. Okay, it's not the same as car camping. The gear isn't the same. Uh, 
you, you don't have the space. You can't handle the weight. You, the thing about, about being prepared for this is you have to prioritize the machine. Okay. You can't, uh, you can't prioritize your comfort. So you kind of have to have the axle because if you don't rides over, you kind of have to have the boot because if you don't rides over, you kind of have to have your toolkit, your jack, your extraction gear, your winch, your recovery, all that stuff is in my opinion, must have critical gear. And so what's left might not be enough room for, for real whoopee gear. And uh, so if you think of it like you're going backpacking, except you don't have to carry the backpack, you're going to be much better off when you get out on the trail. The tidy, you know, nesting uh, toolkits, the kind of tidy nesting uh, uh, camp wear and, and, and plates and all that kind of stuff really does pay off because it lets you splurge on tents and uh, in ground pads, which, you know, like Cam said, is probably the most important piece of comfort gear. Ben, Ben, what was it kind of your thoughts going as I know you have a lot of reservations on finishing the trip and we want to go back and finish that and you want to conquer that last leg of the trip. Um, you know, and obviously your, your perspective is going to be based a little bit around kind of your situation, how you went out. Um, kind of what are your thoughts on, on how things ended and what would you be doing different? How, what, what's your perspective on this? Myself, uh, my gear, I didn't feel a failure in any of my gear. You know, the, the fact that I've done some, this multi-day rides before I, I, it's always a fine tuning. I'm never, you're never done getting your, your gear dialed in. The one, the biggest takeaway that I'll, I will preach is, uh, don't be finishing your stuff the week before get your stuff done long before that get some miles on your rig before you after you change anything get some miles on your rig and get that week before a long trip to get some quality rest that way you're not already 20 30 hours of sleep behind before you get on your trip right and that's Good definitely point. that's a definitely something that I took out of Washington and then didn't really respect going into Idaho as much as I should have was I was putting in tons of time, garage time, wrenching, getting things ready because I had just coming off this other trail too. So I wanted to make sure everything was back up to snuff and making sure I had everything was ready to go. But I wasn't actually like I've literally lost 20. I think I've lost now 22 pounds uh, since I started the Washington Trail all the way through the Idaho Trail. And it wasn't because I'm dieting or exercising or any okay. of that stuff. It's just the fact that I'm sweating my ass off in the garage and then not eating a ton of of. Um, uh, food on the trail and all that other stuff. So, um, you know, that's all it's a jerky stuff. diet. Uh, Ian, did you have anything else to add to that? Well, you know, I, I'm not going to presume to know what people want or what people need out on trail. I mean, any, any dollar you spend towards recovery gear, in my opinion, is a good dollar, good dollar spent. But I mean, I'm on a two seater and Cam and I loaded that thing out with all of our gear, like everything that we needed for what wound up being eight days. We didn't overwhelm the car. The car, uh, Cam can chime in on this. Cam, did you feel like the car was overweight whatsoever? Uh, no, I, I thought the car was overall really happy. Um, yeah. And I think with Cooper and I's, you know, I've done a lot of like ultimate adventure stuff with Coop um, and just doing the vehicle based adventure stuff, you kind of understand that your ride quality, the ride quality you're going to get, um, out of trying to use less gear is always a benefit. So, you know, when you're with a side by side, side by sides are designed to have weight in certain places. So when you start adding weight in places that weight wasn't designed to go, uh, it, it affects the handling characteristics. And I always tell people, it's like, if, uh, this last group that I just went out with, two of them had a stinger hitch, yeah. they had a stinger, hitch. they had everything from coolers to gas to, to five to eight gallons of water hanging off the back of that stu uh, stinger hitch. And their car's going up like this, or their car's running at a 20% uh, incline, basically right. where all the weight is towards the back. Like mine in Washington. Well, and what was happening <laughs> is it was costing us time. So when you overload your rig like that, you're costing the group time. And I, I, I told those guys at one point, because we had a very ambitious goal for day two. And I told those guys, I'm like, all right, I'm going to waypoint exactly where we're at right here. And you guys are going to gut your car. 
gut your car, hide all this crap, crap out in the woods and we'll grab it on the way home. And I mean, it's one of those things where, I, you know, Wes has been doing overlanding for a long time. If there is, if there's just a ton of stuff that you want to take, take your freaking Toyota, or your Jeep, you know, the, these machines are made for certain applications and it, when you, you could, it's easily easy to overwhelm them with, with weight. It's going to screw When you screw up the handling characteristics, you're, you're, you're jeopardizing your safety as well as everybody else's. And you're robbing your, it doesn't hurt to do it in a four seater either that too for sure so uh you know there's been a lot to kind of absorb from this trip and i don't think any one of us would have changed the experience at all except for maybe ben Rowland, but and maybe staying in my x3 for the whole thing <laughs> but uh <laughs> there's been a lot to uh take into take into account there's you know hundreds of stories that we all have that we could spend all day on but uh, this has already been a long podcast i want to kind of wrap up um you know Wes, where can we find you guys online? How can we follow you and what you're doing? Two Frogs Racing on Instagram uh, will be mostly myself and myself and almost always with Mike. And uh, I'll tell you right now, it's a pretty uh, wide ranging thing from campfires and playing music to off-roading and racing. Uh, it's it's more of a uh, just what we're up to thing than it is a professional uh, place to go buy parts or something. It's, it's, it's just a personal blog. Gotcha. And, uh, Cameron, where can we find you and what you're creating online? I know there's a lot of stuff you've been teasing, uh, online. Where can we find what you're doing? Uh, yeah. So my personal Instagram is Cam Hooch, um, C A M H O O T C H. And then, uh, my company page for film, um, and that sort of thing is momentum media co. And then, um, I'm also doing some, lifestyle based content with uh adv bikes kind of you name it van van life camping mountain biking all that kind of stuff and that is dirt portal uh on instagram youtube and facebook so yep and also, hey did your mom watch that she did she was stoked so yeah <laughs> yeah so and then also just keep up to date with the off-road and diesel guys i create a lot of a lot of fun stuff for these guys so give mm -hmm. those guys a peep too so, uh, Coop, you want to give a shout out to where you guys are, are online? Yeah, Instagram, Facebook, YouTube, all of it with uh, offroadpowerproducts.com. And uh, and so just describe, it. for those that don't know what, what it is, what are you guys doing over at Offroad Power Products? We're, we're a retailer. So basically, I, I justify all these adventures I go on as me trying out new parts <laughs> and seeing what does and doesn't break so that, well... Frankly, you, you don't have to. I will go ahead and break it for you so that you know what does and doesn't work. And then, uh, and then help guide people. And, and it's one of those things like, you know, we, we fell into this because we enjoy off-roading. We enjoy all those aspects of it. And uh, we have, have moved into a spot where we get to do exactly what we love every single day of the week. So we're not really working. And uh, we uh, get to... Uh, help you guys with your adventures and anything you want to do. So, <laughs> so something that you guys haven't talked about at all uh, is the fact that you guys have a podcast as well. So uh, what's that all about? Well, we like to, uh, again, share uh, from our experience and sometimes, you know, experience is a, is a good teacher, but uh, it's not the best. So if we can pass on a couple of morsels of info or uh, give you some uh, pointers on how to put together a rig or, or whatnot, then uh, we would like to do that and help you out. And that's uh, the uh, America's Off-Road Podcast is the uh, Off-Road Podcast. And yeah, speaking to Coop, um, everyone at Off-Road, um, they are truly passionate about what they do and it, and it shows, you know, with the products that they carry. So um, yeah, it works out sweet to get to film and photograph those guys. For awesome. Sure. So check out America's Off-Road Podcast. Uh, I'm assuming on all the podcast streaming places. Yep, I would list them off, but I am not very good at that. There's, There's like, like a hundred of them. So. A spot a tube, a unify, a whatever, you know. Perhaps and, uh, Chris Farley could list them off. Yeah. Oh, there we go. Yeah, no. That, <laughs> Uh, if, if there's anything I regret is not getting those all captured on audio over yeah. the radio on the trip. So, uh, all right. Uh, you know, on behalf of Ian, Ben, Wes, Coop, Cameron, uh, donkey, bam, yeah, like yes. just everybody. Shout that out to Mike. <laughs> and then Mike, um, that couldn't be Mike's with us pet. because he's working. Um, <laughs> uh, and, uh, Mike's otter. We all appreciate you for joining us on the off side by side guys, off road podcast. Yeah. And until next time, Peace.